a call to order. The special meeting of the Governing Board of Education is called to order by Dr. Joseph Komrowski at 4 o'clock p.m. on Tuesday, January 10th, 2023 at the Temecula Valley High School Theater. Item B, approval of the agenda. Are there any requests for changes to the agenda? We'll take a motion and a second to approve the agenda as presented. Moved by Mr. Schwartz. Any second? Second. Seconded by Mr. Gonzalez. All in favor? Aye. 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 Everybody, uh, motion passes 5 0. See, we're in open session. Um, D attendance, Governing Board, Dr. Joseph Komorowski, President, Mrs. Jen Wiersma, Clerk, Mrs. Allison Barclay, Mr. Danny Gonzalez, Mr. Stephen Schwartz, Secretary of the Board, Dr. Jody McClay, Superintendent, Ms. Nicole Lash, Assistant Superintendent, Business Support Services, Mrs. Kimberly Valles, Assistant Superintendent, Educational Support Services, Mr. Frank Ars, Assistant Superintendent, Human Resource Development, Ms. Nicole Deas, Assistant Superintendent, Student Support Services, and finally, Mrs. Uh, Lene Anasabar, Executive Assistant to the Superintendent. Um, e, Pledge of Allegiance. We can all rise and face the flag. Public comments. Public comment is restricted to only items listed on the special meeting agenda. All comments will be limited up to three minutes in the order received to a maximum total time of 30 minutes. Unless the items have been placed on the published agenda in, in accordance with the Brown Act, there shall be no action taken. No discussion will be made regarding personal issues in open session. All public comments are an important part of the board meeting and are given careful consideration by the governing board. The purpose of this meeting is to conduct business, so I'll just a uh, gentle reminder. We appreciate all public comments as it gives you a chance to have your voice heard, so I remind you, if your comments um, fall outside of the specificity of the items listed below on G, the Brown Act, Department Overviews, Governance Handbook, or Committee Representation, um, if you hear the gavel, that just means you fall outside of that, and then your mic will be silenced. So we, we can only take comments in regarding uh, those four things. If you want to comment on, you know, outside of those four things, best thing to do is come to January 31st, where public comments then are open to anything. Okay, we have one uh, public comment, uh, Sherry Franklin. Good afternoon. Sherry. Hello, my name is Sherry Franklin, and I am a community member and parent to three former students here in the district. Today's agenda is all about rules, following rules, training and educating district personnel to follow the rules, a 50-page governance handbook to tell the new board members how to follow the rules. The Brown Act is 114 pages, but not linked on the agenda for tonight's training. That means everyone must trust the attorney making the presentation. It appears, thankfully, this district makes rules a priority. But if rules are so important in this district, why do they only follow the ones they like and ignore the violations? TVUSD policies state that the role of a staff advisor for non-curriculum related student groups, quote, may be assigned voluntarily to observe meetings for purposes of maintaining order and protecting safety. Staff advisors and other school employees shall not promote, lead, or participate in the meetings. When teachers organize and enlist other teachers and activate students from their LGBTQ Rainbow Club at Rancho Vista for their day of silence, they are not following the rules. When the principal at Chaparral High School calls an emergency meeting of all the school club presidents, 
along with six other teachers and a former board member to protest the new school board members, you're not following the rules. When board member Mr. Schwartz shows up during the school day on the campus at Great Oak to help organize and activate students to protest the new board members' resolutions, you're not following the rules. California Education Code Section 7054 states, quote, no school district or community college district funds, services, supplies, or equipment shall be used for the purpose of urging the support or defeat of any ballot measure or candidate, including but not limited to any candidate for election to the governing board of the district. But when you allow the governance handbook that the district prepared for us today says, when all board decisions have been reached, all board members shall support that decision. You can see that the other board members are not following the rules. There is a majority on this board, that's very clear. When the other board members, including Mrs. Barclay and Mr. Schwartz, plot and plan ways to divide the board's messaging to the district, you have a problem with following the rules. When the attorney gives wrong advice to the majority board members because it doesn't favor his political ideas, you're not following the rules. And when a superintendent does not shut down excessive and aggressive protesting at board meetings or harassing emails by protecting her board members. Thank you, Sherry. Okay, that's all for public comments. Thank you. Um, now we're on to um, <coughs> G, board workshop, continuation of board member onboarding. Number one, the Brown Act. And I believe we're turning this over to Todd Robbins. Good afternoon. Todd. All right. Uh, so today, we're going to go over the, the Brown Act. If you go ahead to go to slide two. Uh, our agenda is going to cover kind of the real important basics of the Brown Act. And then towards the end, uh, we'll get into some of the board bylaws of the district that touch upon issues related to the Brown Act uh, so we can make sure that we maintain compliance with the Brown Act even away from board meetings and in how we communicate outside of board meetings. Um, We'll talk a little bit about social media. There were some questions about that at the last meeting, so I just wanted to reiterate those issues. Uh, and then at the end, it says there's time for question or discussion, but to the extent you have any questions as we go along, please feel free to ask them. Next slide. Sorry, you know, we're both gonna be working here on the <laughs> presentation. Um, all right, so the Brown Act uh, is California's open meeting law. Um, the legislature expressed an intent that the business of the people be done in open, uh, and so the Brown Act is the legislative manifestation of that policy. So what is a meeting? A meeting is any gathering of a majority of this body. It doesn't have to happen in this room. Uh, it doesn't have to happen within the district boundaries. If three people meet at a Denny's in Riverside and they discuss school district business, that's a meeting as defined by the Brown Act. So be aware of that, that a meeting is any gathering of a majority of the board. Um, and and it's, it, there's that caveat in there, to discuss or transact district business. Uh, but bear in mind, the legislature has actually really broadened uh, the definition of the meeting, of a meeting to include hearing uh, information related to district business. There are some exceptions within the Brown Act uh, where a majority of the board can be present to hear things related to, the dis to district business, but unless the, the gathering that's taking place falls within one of those narrow exceptions, uh, it's a potential Brown Act violation. So just be mindful of that. Uh, be mindful of how many people are gathering together and, and where you're gathering and things of that nature. And obviously, the, the default rule is that a meeting can only take place uh, if the meeting has been properly agendized and the public has been provided notice and an opportunity to appear at the meeting. And we'll talk about uh, agendas in just a few minutes. 
Uh, it's important when we're talking about this concept of meetings that we must avoid serial meetings. Uh, we'll go through some uh, kind of, I guess, their little graphics to help us understand what is and what is not a serial meeting. Um, but we want to avoid serial meetings uh, because three people may not be present in the same room or in the same location with each other, but if three people are having a conversation via email or through intermediaries, then again, we have a problem under the Brown Act. There's some exceptions, uh, as I mentioned to this rule, conferences that are open to the public. The best example I can give you is CSBA. Um, there, at that uh, meeting, it's open to the public. They can buy uh, tickets to go to CSBA. They don't have to be board members. Uh, they can listen to the sessions that, that school board members attend. Uh, and so that's one exception that's possible. Purely social or ceremonial events, like a wedding or uh, somebody's retirement party or an anniversary party, things of that nature, those are fine. Um, but you always want to be mindful that you don't want to transact, discuss, or hear district business while you're at a wedding. I mean, who would want to do that anyway? Um, but just be mindful of that, that you know, if you're congregating in a corner and discussing the school district budget at a wedding, that's a, that's a potential Brown Act problem. So be mindful of that. Um, locations uh, of meetings, the meetings need to be open to the public. They need to be ADA accessible. Uh, on most agenda cover pages, there's uh, uh, ADA accommodation notifications that if anybody needs accommodations to participate in this meeting, they'll be granted. And so just uh, make sure that you're in compliance with that as well. Uh, and then your meetings generally, I, I mentioned that it doesn't matter where a meeting takes place, but the meetings that you have that are agendized uh, must take place within district boundaries. There's some limited exceptions to that, uh, interviewing um, uh, candidates for superintendent, for example, is one, one exception that comes up from time to time. A majority of the board will notice a meeting to take place at a school district in Northern California, for example, to have an evaluation or discussion about a potential superintendent contact, uh, a superintendent contract. We've seen that uh, take place on occasion. Any questions about meetings? This one's sometimes kind of the hardest one to wrap your head around because it seems really easy to get in trouble here. So just, if you have any questions on this for clarification. Please yeah, I got one, uh, Todd. Sure. Can three members talk about a resolution already passed after it's been agendized and voted on, or is that a violation of the Brown Act as well? It's a violation of the Brown Act as well. Got it. So it has to be. It would have to be here, not Got here it. in this theater, but at a agenda properly agendized meeting. Okay. Any other questions? So just to clarify. Yeah. Any conversation regarding district business between more than two board members would be a violation? Outside of a properly noticed and agendized meeting, it would be a, a Brown Act violation. Okay, and, I, and you're gonna talk about serial meetings I saw in there. So yeah, serial be, meetings okay. will be coming up. Perfect. We have some Thank little you. graphics to help conceptualize it a little bit. Thank you. Some additional meeting op uh, options that people have that are kind of exceptions to that requirement that everybody be here uh, in the, the boardroom. Uh, we have the teleconferencing exception. This exception existed prior to the pandemic, uh, and this allows a school district to, uh, or any legislative body for that matter, to post on their agenda uh, at the time, you know, whether it's 72 hours for a regular meeting or 24 hours for a special meeting, uh, to post on their agenda that somebody is going to be participating from the meeting via teleconference, and then the specific information that is required is the exact location where the person will be participating and uh, the place where those people can come to participate and make public comment in the meeting and observe if they want. Um, so this is an interesting exception because when you teleconference under this exception, you have to be in a fixed location. We sometimes get clients who will call and say, I have a board member who is gonna be driving to Phoenix but would like to call in, can they do that? And if they can identify, you know, a gas station where they will be stopped, 
for a rest area where they will be stopped and stay there for the entire time, yes, they could participate in the meeting via teleconference because we would post the location of that rest area or gas station, the address, uh, and then that area, that person's car, for example, they could stand next to the car. Hopefully it's not raining um, so that <laughs> you know they don't have to be in their car. Uh, but somebody could realistically come and participate in that meeting. And they'd actually have to post a, an agenda at that location as well. So we want to be in compliance with the 72-hour, 24-hour requirement. Uh, so we'd have to ask the gas station, for example, to post a copy of the agenda uh, 72 hours in advance. You think this is absurd, but let me tell you how frequently we get this question. We get this question a lot. And some of the different flavors of places we've gotten are cruise ships, um, campgrounds, uh, amusement parks, uh, and we, we even got one from a board member who was serving in Afghanistan uh, and was stationed at that, I think it was Bagram Air Force Base, the, the large Air Force Base there, and wanted to know if he could participate remotely uh, under this teleconferencing exception. And the analysis was, while members of the armed forces could participate, it's not truly an area that's open to the public, and so we felt like when it comes to the legislative intent, it, it's probably not consistent to allow him to participate in the meeting. Uh, and he understood. He wasn't, he wasn't you know, digging in his heels or anything like that. But it was an interesting question. Um, if you're participating from a hotel, for example, we generally recommend that you use the business conference area so that you don't have to allow people to come into your room um, because who knows who might come in and, and we don't want to put anybody's safety at risk. Um, but if you ever need this exception, make sure you give your superintendent plenty of time to plan for it uh, because it's not something that's easily done quickly. Um, so just keep that in mind. We have some other exceptions that are post-pandemic um, as a result of the recognition that we now have video conferencing technology that's a lot better. Uh, and so as of this year, January 1, uh, two members can participate via teleconference without following those uh, uh, agenda requirements that I just talked about. Um, but there, it's for a limited reason. It has to be for an emergency or because they are sick uh, or, or something like that. So it's not just a, hey, I don't want to come be in person situation. There has to be a reason for it. Um, when you're participating via teleconference, whether it's with the pre-pandemic exception or the post-pandemic exception, the key is accessibility. Um, you don't have to post an agenda under the new exception at the site where you'll be teleconferencing. Um, and you don't have to have that location open to the public for, for participation. But the means of communication, the, the Zoom or whatever you use, Microsoft Teams, there needs to be an opportunity for the public to participate through that uh, software. So you have to have a Zoom link that people could come in and make public comment on if you're going to be participating via Zoom as well. All right, next slide, serial meetings. So as we get into this, it's, it's best to start with kind of the most basic serial meeting example, and that's the game of telephone. Member one speaks to member two, who speaks to member three about members uh, one and two's conversation, uh, and then member three then goes to member four, and member four goes to member five, and now all of the, it, it became a problem once member two talked to member three, and then the problem just perpetuated after that. So that's kind of a, a classic example of a serial meeting. Uh, in my experience, this was the most rare example of a serial meeting, but it's a good way to kind of get our heads around what a basic example of a serial meeting is. Uh, all right, go ahead and go to the next slide. So the question would be, is this a serial meeting where member one is speaking to member two and member three and member four, but they're not speaking between each other? And the answer to the question is it's probably a serial meeting. Um, the only reason it wouldn't be a serial meeting uh, 
it's hard to, to hone an exception to this. You don't want to engage in this, but there may be limited reasons why it might not be, uh, if only to potentially schedule a special meeting. That would probably be the one exception where you wouldn't necessarily get in trouble for this type of conversation. But any other substantive conversation, that could be problematic. Okay, next slide. So this is the hub and spoke example. This is a common uh, form of communication. So the hub in this case is the superintendent. And this is a one-way communication from the superintendent to all five board members providing the board members with information that's critical um, to the district. Uh, sometimes this comes in the form of a Friday memo. Sometimes this comes in the form of a communication when some sort of emergency is happening at a school site. Um, so this is the most common kind of uh, communication where you're going to see potentially all five board members involved. But what you're, the best practice in this particular case is for the superintendent to send the communication to the entire board um, in a manner that prevents or, or eliminates the possibility of a reply all situation. Because under this scenario, it's fine for the superintendent to blast information out. But if one board member accidentally replies all, then it becomes a problem. So this one's, this one's something that, you know, uh, Dr. McClay, who's an experienced superintendent, knows how to manage and knows how to help the board stay successful with this. But uh, it's one to just be mindful of. Todd, I have a question for sure. clarification. So as a board president too, am I not allowed to reply all? Or is there a scenario where I, where I reply all and it's not a serial? Meeting? A board member shouldn't be replying all regardless of their position on the board. Okay, thank you. Yep. So go ahead to the, oh, thank you. Uh, this is a possible serial meeting uh, violation. And I say possible because again, if they're talking about when to schedule a special meeting, we're probably okay. Um, these are a series of one-way communications from one board member to two other board members. So you have three board members involved. It's a one-way communication. Um, if, if the intent behind the communication is to develop a collective concurrence about an item of district business, then we have a Brown Act problem. Uh, if the intent is just to get a schedule for purposes of scheduling a meeting, not a Brown Act problem. Next slide, unless you have any questions on that one. Okay, so I think, Dr. K, this might be a kind of a example of where you were going with your question to me, so I, I might be able to help out here. So I guess the question is, is there a violation here? You have the superintendent who has sent out a communication to all five. You have two board members who are engaging in one-way communications back to the superintendent, and then two board members engaging in a one-way communication separate and apart from the group. Anybody wanna, it's okay if you don't, I get it, but <laughs> if you wanna take a stab at it, feel free. This is, this is probably not a serial communication. Um, so Dr. Komoransky, you could reply individually to the superintendent um, and similarly member four could reply individually and that wouldn't be a problem. Like I said in, in my previous comment, it only becomes a problem with reply all. And then the other two are okay uh, because they're not engaged in a conversation with a third board member, uh, and so long as it stays that way, that's not a problem. So two board members can communicate. It becomes a problem when a third person is brought in. So if two board members are communicating, if members two and three are communicating about something, and then member three goes to member four and says, hey, and it's, a, it's still just two people talking, but they say, hey, me and members member two spoke about this and we decided to do this, that's, that's where the problem happens. So you have to stay away from, from that potential. And that's why it's important to be cognizant of, you know, who other board members have spoken with potentially about things. 
Dr. McClay is not going to share with you the nature of your feelings about a topic in her individual conversations with you because she doesn't want to be the facilitator of a Brown Act violation. So she's not going to say, hey, I just met with member one and she thinks this about this topic. Um, what do you think about this topic? Because she's not going to want to be the facilitator of a Brown Act violation, so she's going to stay away from it. Similarly, you don't want to do that uh, in your position. Um, so, all right. And then this last one, you can see here um, the possible violation happens because you have three members communicating to the superintendent and then you have members two and three linking to the superintendent in that communication. So um, there could be potential violations here because the superintendent may have inadvertently shared information uh, that creates a Brown Act problem. Um, but again, that where the, the members two and three join back into the group conversation, that's where problems arise. All right, any questions about serial meetings? I mentioned the superintendent could be the facilitator because one of the things you're gonna hear in any other Brown Act training that you do as well is intermediaries. Uh, intermediaries cannot be used to communicate for purposes of, you know, of trying to avoid a Brown Act problem. So two people uh, couldn't contact me and then say, hey, go ahead and share this with board member number three. I would be facilitating a Brown Act problem at that point. And so um, even an intermediary can cause a potential Brown Act problem. So be mindful of who you're speaking with and, and about what uh, and who other people on the board might be speaking to uh, just so you can avoid the intermediary uh, problem. All right, any questions before we go on? All right, so meeting conduct. This is a, just a real basic slide of what a typical board meeting looks like, and, and you all did that already today, but the meeting is called to order. In order to call the meeting to order, you have to have at least three board members present. If only two board members are present, you can't start the meeting. Um, and in a situation like that where, where two board members are absent for whatever reason, any action that is taken by the board must pass by a 3-0 vote because the legislature in the education code has said that action is taken by a majority of the board, not a majority of those present. And so if there are only three board members present and the meeting is called to order, for example, and a motion is made to approve the agenda and two board members vote to approve the agenda and one board member votes not to approve the agenda, then you don't have an agenda. Um, so I've actually been in a board meeting where that happened uh, and got to go home early. And so um, that's a, an interesting situation. So just be mindful of that. If there ever comes a time in the next couple of years where it's only three people present, it's going to take all three people to vote on something for it to pass. Uh, you can add to the agenda in certain cases after it's been posted, but these are very limited exceptions. Um, it has to be a, a legitimate emergency. It can't be, oh, we forgot to add something to the agenda. It has to be a legitimate emergency. So for example, um, was this agenda, Dr. McClay, was it posted 24 hours or was it posted longer than that? 72. Okay, it was posted. It's a special meeting, so it only needed uh, 24. So let's just say for the purposes of this hypothetical that it was posted 24 hours. It posted yesterday. We've had all these rains. Um, let's say today, this morning, you know, one of your elementary schools, before all the kids got there and before anybody got there, the roof caved in because of the rain. Um, and we're needing to contemplate closing the school for some time or relocating the kids. That's a situation where you could invoke this emergency provision and add a discussion item to the agenda to figure out what you're going to do in this situation. That's a legitimate emergency. But like I said, oh, we forgot to put, you know, this vendor contract on the agenda or something like that. That's not going to, 
meet the standard. Public comments. Um, oh, and I should mention the report after closed session. We are going to talk about closed session in more depth, but um, after closed session, you're required to report out any action that's taken by the board. So if there is a vote in closed session on a topic, for example, personnel, um, whether to move forward with some sort of personnel action or not, you're going to need to report out that action uh, when you return from closed session. And you need to report out all of the people who voted yes and all of the people who voted no if the vote wasn't unanimous. So it's a roll call vote at that point. There's public comment requirements. You must allow public comment on closed session items before going into closed session. You must allow comment on open session items at the time uh, that the item is considered or before uh, the item is considered. Uh, at your last meeting, you had public comment before items and public comment when items were considered, so that was all uh, acceptable. Uh, with respect to public comment, uh, Dr. Komaronski made a statement at the beginning of this meeting which was correct. Uh, at a special board meeting, public comment is limited to only the topics that are on the agenda for that meeting. Um, at a regular meeting, public comment is much more broad. It's any items that are within the subject matter jurisdiction of the school board. Uh, and so at a meeting such as this, uh, we couldn't be talking about um, you know, what's going on in the athletic programs, for example, because it's not something that's on the agenda for tonight's meeting. All right. So public comment is subject to reasonable regulation. Uh, the First Amendment does allow what are called time, place, and manner restrictions on speech. So the uh, district's board bylaws have uh, three minutes for individuals, uh, 30 minutes for uh, particular topics, limitations built within their bylaws, and those have been found by the courts to be reasonable time restrictions on speech. Uh, the legislatures and the courts recognize that uh, this is a meeting of the board that is held in public. It is not a meeting that the public gets to necessarily dictate all that happens during. And so uh, the legislature and the courts have recognized that the board needs to conduct its business and so reasonable time restrictions are allowed. Uh, if translators are requested, uh, you need to double the amount of time an individual gets. So if an individual needs a translator, um, they would get six minutes instead of three. There's a court decision um, called Baca versus Moreno Valley. We're not allowed to uh, silence a speaker because they're being critical of an employee or something going on in the district. Um, the Baca versus Moreno Valley decision dealt with an individual who came up uh, and was saying some pretty harsh things about a teacher in the Moreno Valley Unified School District uh, and the board shut that person's microphone off and, and prohibited them from speaking any further. And the court sided with the individual and said, uh, you can't do that, that's going to be a viewpoint uh, discrimination type situation, a content-based restriction, which are prohibited under the First Amendment. And so um, we're not allowed to shut off the microphone if somebody's being critical of something in the district, uh, even if that's an employee. You can direct the person in that situation to the complaint procedures. Um, you can direct them, if they're complaining about an employee, for example, you could direct them to Mr. Arce um, to uh, speak to that person. Uh, but if they want to speak and use their three minutes to register their concerns, they're allowed to do that. Uh, when you uh, are receiving public comment, the Brown Act, uh, specifically Government Code Section 54954.2, uh, includes basically a prohibition on any sort of substantive response to a public comment, and the reason behind that is, if you recall in regular board meetings, they can speak on any item even if it's not on the agenda. If you get into a discussion, respond 
uh, to public comments other than to ask perhaps clarifying questions or refer the speaker to a particular staff member. Um, and it's because the Brown Act has built in kind of the presumption that if a back and forth starts to happen, it's probably not something that was contemplated by the agenda. All right. Um, all right, let's go to the next slide. Agendas need to be posted in advance. We talked about this quickly. So regular meetings, the ones that are on your board calendar that are scheduled for the upcoming year, those must be posted 72 hours in advance of the meeting. Okay, special meetings like this, ones that aren't necessarily planned, sometimes they come up for various reasons, only 24 hours is required. The emergency board meeting exception is very rare. Um, it was used a lot between March 10th and March 13th, March 14th. I was in emergency board meetings on Saturdays uh, when the pandemic happened back in 2020. Um, school districts were having to make decisions about what to do in light of everything they were being told. Um, and so this emergency board meeting exception for the first time in my career <laughs> was used um, quite a bit. Uh, I've the only other time prior to the pandemic that I had seen it used is there was a large earthquake down in um, Imperial County on Easter um, back in 2012 and that school district had to call an emergency meeting to deal with that situation. Agenda items need to reasonably apprise the public of the business to be transacted. Uh, and the purpose behind that is the agenda needs to be something that a, public me a member of the public can look at and decide, do I want to go to the board meeting tonight and speak on a topic, or do I not need to go to the board meeting tonight to speak on a topic? So they need to understand, in a general sense, what business is going on. There has to be a brief general description, usually no more than 20 words is all that's required. Agenda materials provided to the board become public records unless otherwise protected. So any materials that you get in your agenda packet are likely going to be public records that would be disclosable in response to a public records request. We might not have to disclose them because there's some existing exception under the California Public Records Act. And they just renumbered the act. so. Um, I don't have the new number right off the top of my head, but it used to, the exceptions used to reside within government code section 6254. So if a document within your agenda packet was covered by one of those exceptions, we wouldn't have to disclose it. One of the best examples is uh, an employee's personnel file. Um, you, you don't have to disclose an employee's personnel file, um, nor do you have to disclose documents related to uh, employee discipline um, if that discipline situation is still ongoing, okay? But any other document is likely going to be disclosable that comes within that agenda packet. To the extent that the board gets additional materials between the 72 hour posting and the start of the board meeting, those materials uh, need to be made available to the public without delay and there's some new, accept, uh, new requirements that we post those on our website uh, right away. Uh, so these types of issues come up from time to time, but as a general rule, uh, your, your team here is, is very experienced and will get your agenda prepared such that you're not getting additional documents uh, close in time to the meeting. All right, any questions on open session before we move to closed? All right. So closed session is the exception to the open meeting rule. Um, the legislature recognizes that legislative bodies need to be able to have candid discussions about certain things. Uh, and so they've allowed for closed session for limited circumstances. And so on this list, uh, the things you see the most are conference with real property negotiators, conference with legal counsel regarding existing litigation or anticipated litigation, uh, liability claims uh, that come into the district, uh, threats to public service, uh, public employee appointment. So to the extent the board is going to hire a new principal uh, at uh, one of the high schools, the board can meet in closed session prior to uh, 
the meeting to have a discussion about who the candidate is that's being recommended by uh, the administration. Um, in some districts, they even call that individual in so they can meet them, say hello, congratulate them, um, and then the board in that particular district takes action in open session to, to hire that person so that there can be a celebration. You could appoint that person in open, or I'm sorry, in the closed session under this item. You would just have to report out that you did that, and so you could have the same celebration at the time of the report if you wanted to. Um, public employee performance evaluation. Uh, we want the board to be able to have candid discussions about the performance of its employees. Uh, public employee discipline dismissal release. Uh, this is a confidential conversation about whether an employee should remain as an employee of the district. And then conference with labor negotiators. So the folks that are serving as your representatives at the collective bargaining table will come to you for your parameters, uh, what the board will authorize when it comes to contract language, when it comes to compensation and things of that nature. Uh, and those conversations happen in closed session. And if you think about it, you're looking at uh, several of these, you, uh, real, uh, real property negotiations, litigation issues, uh, collective bargaining. And the idea, the policy behind allowing those conversations to happen in closed session relate to maintaining you know, your competitive advantage in uh, real estate negotiations if you're thinking about swapping a parcel of land or buying a piece of property. Uh, and the same goes for collective bargaining and, and litigation. You don't want to have open conversations with your legal counsel about strategy in defending uh, you know, some sort of lawsuit that's been filed against the district. So the public purpose is confidentiality, obviously. Uh, go ahead to the- Question, please. Oh, sure, sure. Uh, we always discuss student discipline in closed session, but I didn't see that in the list. I didn't include that in the list, but you're right, because it's not in the, student discipline isn't in the Brown Act. That's a kind of an ed code exception, but it's a good, it's a good point. Student discipline, uh, and, and student discipline and student matters are governed by several laws. You have the education code, and then you also have FERPA, the federal uh, privacy law for students. Um, so th these are all of the sources of laws that kind of reaffirm that pupil records are confidential under all circumstances. All right. So only matters announced in open session or in the agenda shall be considered during closed session. So again, I just kind of reiterate the list of things that we had on the, the prior slide. Um, you can't deviate from what's on the agenda. So let's say you have uh, public employee discipline dismissal release as your only topic on uh, the closed session agenda for that night. But let's say a really sweet real estate deal becomes available and you find out about it, you know, the superintendent finds out about it just before the meeting starts and, and wants to present it to you. Can't do it. It's not on the agenda, so you can't do it. Um, so you're just going to have to either call a special meeting to take place the next day to talk about the deal or do it at your next regular meeting if it's not time sensitive. Uh, it's important as a, as a requirement under the Brown Act that the board has to convene in open session before adjourning to closed session. So the board has to open the meeting in public and allow public comment to happen on the closed session agenda items before adjourning to closed session. And then the last point on this slide I think is, is really critical and is the most important. Uh, the board members shall not disclose confidential information received in closed session to any person not authorized by the Brown Act, or by the board rather, to receive such information. So information that you receive in closed session is for you, it's not for anybody else. It's not for your spouse. Um, I think I mentioned, you know, at the previous meeting, it's not for your personal attorney. Uh, it's not for the mailman, it's not for the, your priest, it's not for anything. It's for the, the five of you and the other administrators who may be present and giving you the information at the time. Go ahead to the next slide. There's a couple provisions 
Uh, the first is an attorney general opinion. The act, the Brown Act, recognizes exceptional situations where the need for confidentiality outweighs the interest in openness. So this is one interpretation of the legislative intent behind why we get to go into closed session. And then government code section 54963 says a person shall not, or may not rather, disclose confidential information that has been acquired by being present in an authorized closed session to a person not entitled to receive it. So there's a specific Brown Act prohibition about sharing confidential information. Any questions? All right, next slide. So there's some enforcement mechanisms in the Brown Act. The first is, is most easily interpreted if a majority of the board convenes in a way that freezes out the public from knowing what's going on, um, th those individuals may be guilty of a misdemeanor. So there are some potential criminal penalties within the Brown Act um, related to secret meetings. Obviously, that would be kind of the best example. Uh, it would be a serial meeting potentially too. But again, there, there has to be an intent. Um, you see in the middle of that language uh, where the member intends to deprive the public. So there's going to be a proof requirement if an individual is charged with a misdemeanor under this provision. Uh, where they're going to have to prove that that person intended to hide the information. Uh, we talked about what action means, but I'll, I'll reiterate it again. Action is not just a vote uh, to say yay or nay. I mentioned earlier that action can be hearing matters of district business, discussing matters of district business. Uh, so action is defined very broadly under the Brown Act. So uh, just be mindful of of that broad except or that broad rule. All right, next some specific kind of procedural rules that are required by the Brown Act. You need to report and record individual votes on each matter. Um, so you, if you look at your minutes, if an item passes 5-0, um, sometimes they'll just list the names of the individual all five individuals. If an item passes 3-2, they'll list the, the names of the individuals, the three individuals who uh, said yay and the two individuals who said nay. Um, but that's a, that's a requirement under the Brown Act. And I mentioned coming out of closed session, if a closed session motion passes 3-2 or 4-1, you have to read all of the names of those who voted yay and all of the names who voted nay. Uh, you can't just say it was 4-1. You can say it was unanimous and not have to read everybody's name because we all know you're here. Um, but if it's 4-1, we need to know who voted in which way. <coughs> uh, you must vote on employment contracts in open session at a regular meeting. So employment contracts cannot be discussed uh, at a special meeting such as this uh, they can only be discussed at a regular meeting, one that's been agendized 72 hours in advance. And any action taken on with respect to an employment contract, uh, approving an employment contract, has to happen in open session. And this is a result of the City of Bell situation that was happening around 2010 or so, uh, and kind of the secret, not secret, but special meetings that were called to happen happen at like 11 o'clock at night and then approve the city manager's contract and give the person retiree health benefits and super high wages and things like that. So uh, those are the things that the legislature was trying to uh, prohibit. When you are considering uh, the contract for one of your local agency executives, uh, the administrators that are up on this dais, government code section 54953 requires an oral report on the salary and other fringe benefits that are included within the contract that you're going to be considering before you start discussing and considering that contract. And so typically, if you're doing a contract renewal for uh, your superintendent, for example, um, and the superintendent's salary is staying the same, but you're just changing the term of the contract, um, you know, an oral report might be, you know, the board is going to consider uh, an amendment to the superintendent's contract to add two years to the term, um, but the salary and fringe benefit provisions remain unchanged, okay? 
you can't have discussions uh, of salaries uh, and benefits in closed session except in the context of labor negotiations, and it is, uh, it is okay to discuss administrative compensation under a conference with labor negotiator unrepresented employee, and oftentimes um, a board will designate its legal counsel, me, uh, for example, to negotiate with the superintendent or the assistant superintendent, although oftentimes the superintendent serves as the negotiator for the assistant superintendents. But in any event, I would be coming into closed session in that example and meeting with you and saying, hey, I've, I've spoken to your superintendent and, and her representative about her salary concerns or recommendations. Here's what she wants. How would you like me to you know, counter what she's asking for or would you like us to accept this? You know, and you provide me with the direction. It's the same manner in which you provide Mr. Arce direction in collective bargaining. Um, it, it's just a different context. So you can discuss salary in that very narrow context in closed session. Uh, and then the agenda, this is a procedural requirement. Your agenda has to be posted on the website. Kind of goes without saying these days. Um, everybody's doing it, but I remember when this provision came into play and people were having a real hard time with it for some reason. Um, so we don't need to belabor that issue. Um, all right. So related to I'm compliance sorry, can with I ask the a quick question? Oh, of sorry course. about that before yeah. we move on. So you said that we most must vote on employment contracts in open session in a regular meeting. That's right. So any change whatsoever to any contract has to be at a regular meeting? If you're changing a contract, um, adding a years to a term, for example, or changing salaries or things like that, changing the terms of the contract, that all has to happen at a regular meeting in okay, open session. not a special meeting. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Yep. All right, so compliance with the Brown Act requires, you know, effective board protocols as well. And so you have some board bylaws uh, that talk about the role of the board, the role of indiv individual board members, and these are all here to help the board stay within compliance of the various laws, whether it's the Brown Act, whether it's um, conflict of interest provisions, which is a whole other topic. Um, so your board bylaws include uh, these protocols. So I'll start out with the kind of the role of the board, governance rules. And these are, these are things that are, like I said, included in your bylaws and they help you stay within compliance of all the things you need to be in compliance with. Um, your role as a board is distinct from administration's role, okay? Uh, the board doesn't manage or direct day-to-day -day operations of the district. That's why the board hires a superintendent to do that. Uh, board members are equal and authority rests with the board as a whole, not with individual board members. So out in the community, if you're talking to a friend who owns a business, um, you wouldn't be able to individually bind the district to use that business's services, for example. Um, so if you felt like you had somebody that might be good for providing services to the district, the recommendation would be to bring it to Dr. McClay or the appropriate cabinet member, say, hey, is this something you want to research? Um, and that person will research it and bring information back to the board uh, at a later date. But an individual board member has no authority. The authority of the board rests in the majority of the board, okay? Uh, the board sets policy, vision, goals, and direction. Again, these are concepts that are enumerated in your board bylaws. The superintendent implements the board's policy, vision, and direction through delegation to the appropriate executive departments. The board does not manage or direct the day-to-day -day operations of the district. All right, next slide. This is kind of an org chart. Sorry, I'm gonna sure. be annoying. So no, not apologize. annoying at all. <laughs> I always have a lot of questions. So, so on that on that last slide. So, if there's something as a board member that we want to have happen, mm -hmm. or that we want someone in the cabinet or any anyone to do, those things have to come through a board meeting and have to be. In other words, we can't act individually. 
Correct. Your bylaws member. have a provision in there that an individual board member cannot direct a district employee uh, or otherwise obligate a district employee to perform to do something. something. Right. So, um, so the way to do that would be to agendize it on an agenda. And or, a or make an information request through the superintendent's office. For example, let's say you have an expenditure um, for construction um, and you're just feeling like you want an update on that information. Instead of contacting the CBO, which you know, some districts have that line of communication, but the best practice is to say to Dr. McClay, hey, I was thinking about this construction project, I'm concerned about costs. Um, can we get a breakdown of current expenditures and what the budget is and things like that? Mm -hmm. And then Dr. McClay could get that information and send it out to you in one of those hub and spoke communications. So it's not impossible and you're not restricted to a majority of the board asking to get something only at meetings. I mean, individual board members can request information, but it needs to be, you know, done through the appropriate channels. Perfect. Thank you. So just let me follow up on that. <clears throat> I'm visiting school A and I noticed that um, there's an issue in the, uh, the yard that there's mm -hmm. a lot of water accumulating from the rain. And I think it's a dangerous situation. I would just call Jody and say, hey, can you have whoever is in charge of facilities take a look at this and see what's going on? That's a best practice, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, um, and I, I, I wanted to say that visiting school sites, you want to make sure that the superintendent knows which sites you're visiting, um, just as a, it's, it's a courtesy, because you know, school campuses are, are secure no. as mm -hmm. they can be. So, I, Just to follow up, we only visit after it's been approved by the superintendent and yeah. someone from the cabinet goes with us to visit school sites. Yeah. I don't, we don't do it on our own. Yeah, I was just making that comment because uh, it's a good, a good best practice as well. Thank you. Any other questions on that previous slide about individual board members? All right, so just gonna again, go to this kind of org chart. It's easy to visualize. The board sets policy, vision, goals, and direction for the district, you hire the superintendent to implement that. And then the superintendent has her role as the kind of the chief executive officer of the school district, um, making recommendations to you uh, regarding governance decisions, receiving direction from you uh, concerning governance decisions, um, delegating and supervising the cabinet. Uh, because they are, you know, experts in their respective departments, and so uh, Dr. McClay can't do it all, and that's why you have the four individuals sitting across from you over there. Um, she serves as a liaison between the board and stakeholders. Uh, oftentimes, the superintendent will receive communications from the public uh, that are directed to the board. Um, the superintendent may make uh, a public statement uh, at the behest of the board, uh, and so she serves kind of as the liaison um, between the board and the stakeholders. However, as individual board members, you are allowed to go out and meet with your constituents and have conversations and, and things of that nature. So she's, she's not a gatekeeper in that respect, but she serves kind of as the board's voice um, with stakeholders. Uh, she makes recommendations regarding candidates for executive cabinet and administration. And then executive cabinet implements board directives as delegated by the superintendent, supervises day-to-day -day operations of each department. So pretty simple uh, from an org chart perspective. Any questions? All right. And so again, in the kind of the spirit of making sure we comply with the Brown Act and kind of our conflict of interest concerns and things of that nature, due process. The board shall work with the superintendent to fulfill its major roles, which again, setting direction of the district through a process that involves community, parents, students, staff, guardians, and is focused on student learning and achievement. This is again, set forth in board bylaw 9000. Um, when we're talking about these types of things, we're thinking about your LCAP, for example. In my school district, uh, where my kids attend, I just got a text message today 
letting us know of LCAP town halls. Uh, and so, you know, that's something where the board is soliciting feedback from the community uh, regarding the LCAP. So that's an example of, of involving the community and stakeholders in uh, issues related to student learning, student achievement, and governance of the district. <coughs> you establish a, an efficient, and organizational, uh, efficient organizational structure for the district by employing a superintendent, overseeing the development and adoption of policies. So to the extent that there's a uh, policy that you want to have changed, um, you can bring that to the attention of the superintendent and, and she can work with you on that to the extent there's a policy you want to have adopted. Uh, same, same process. And then within your bar board bylaws, it, there are procedures for updating your policies. Usually there's a first reading where the, it's presented for the first time and then at a subsequent meeting, there will be a second reading and the board has the option at that meeting to approve the policy after the second reading or maybe push it to a third reading, which would you know, be a, because some further amendments are needed to the proposed policy. So those types of things regarding policy creation uh, and adoption. Uh, the board establishes academic expectations, approves curriculum uh, and instructional materials. Uh, curriculum adoptions are complex, time-consuming uh, processes where there's a lot of stakeholders involved making recommendations to the board after a lengthy process. Uh, and then there's a period of time where the members of the public can review the proposed curriculum in anticipation of a board's vote uh, to approve the curriculum. Um, so adoption of curriculum has a lot of people involved and there's a lot of public opportunity for participation as well. Uh, the board's responsible for providing safe, uh, adequate facilities and is responsible for setting the parameters for labor negotiations and approving collective bargaining agreements. So at the end of the collective bargaining process, uh, when the sides have reached a tentative agreement, uh, the tentative agreement is brought to the board after it's been, usually after it's been ratified uh, by the relevant labor association and then the board would approve it and there would be the public disclosures about how that uh, collective bargaining agreement impacted the district's budget. Next slide please. Board needs to, uh, under the board's bylaws 9000, the board shall work with the superintendent to fulfill its major roles. Um, the board provides staff, uh, support staff, uh, support, excuse me, to the superintendent and staff um, by adhering to standards of responsible governance protocols, consistently supporting established priorities and goals, and upholding board policies. Uh, ensures accountability to the public for the performance of the district schools by evaluating the superintendent uh, and setting policy for evaluating other personnel. So uh, annually, most school boards evaluate their superintendent, and there's usually a provision within the superintendent's contract regarding certain dates that are important along the way, meetings that should take place for setting goals uh, for the superintendent to work on achieving. The board also uh, monitors the effectiveness of policies and uh, makes changes when appropriate. We kind of addressed that already. And you serve, this is an important one, so I don't wanna have it overlooked. The board serves as a judicial hearing and appeals body in accordance with law, board policies and negotiated agreements. Um, the best example of this is student discipline. You're gonna see student discipline probably at most meetings. Um, and when a student is put up for expulsion, for example, their first uh, avenue of due process is to have their case examined by a panel of administrators. So it's, it's effectively a, a little mini trial where the student gets to put on evidence, the district gets to put on evidence, and the panel of administrators uh, reviews that evidence, considers it, and makes a determination whether to recommend expulsion or some other remedy. If a board member is getting involved on one side or the other prior to the board hearing it at a regularly scheduled meeting in closed session, you know, getting the information from the, the appropriate cabinet member, um, it creates a potential due process concern, conflict of interest concern, 
where somebody could potentially make the argument that the, the board member uh, acted inappropriately because they didn't recuse themselves because they were too intimately involved in the situation before it got to their level. So just be mindful of that. Um, it's hard if you know families that are going through that, but your role uh, as a board member includes that role as kind of serving as a, judi a judicial body. Similarly, in employee matters as well. Uh, for example, in classified uh, discipline, uh, the board generally serves as the last avenue of appeal. The boards often designate that responsibility to a trained hearing officer, um, but the decision in most collective bargaining agreements rendered by that hearing officer is a proposed decision, and the board can then review that decision and adopt it as their own or reject it. But the same principles apply. You don't want to be involved in the process leading up to that consideration because it creates a potential conflict problem for you. Any questions on that one? Sorry, me again. Um, no problem. So back to the, the last slide where you mentioned a town hall. Uh -huh. So how would something like that be conducted? I mean, can it be conducted by the school board without violating the Brown Act? Only if it's agendized. So in this particular case, what, what my school district usually does is they're meeting at the high school that's in my area, my trustee area. Um, it'll be facilitated by a district administrator uh, or two, and maybe the superintendent, and then m probably the board member from my area will be there, but it won't be a board meeting. It'll be kind of a information gathering session, and then all the information gathered at these town halls at the various areas of the district, and then virtual ones as well, will then be brought to the board. Uh, and the LCAP committee is part of the consideration process. So it wouldn't be a town hall in that sense. So it's a one-way communication, meaning that the community is giving their input, not that it's a two-way communication with board members in the community about a topic? Not the whole board, but the individual board member who is there can engage in two-way communications if, if she chooses. So you could do it with one or two board members? Yes but no more than that. And they could engage in a two-way communication with- the, the, the two that are there could. I wouldn't recommend either of those two go to any other right. town halls at that point. So- Because then it would be a serial meeting. That would be a serial meeting. So, sorry to belabor this, but no. one more question. <laughs> so if you had a town hall and that information was provided, it couldn't be discussed amongst board members unless it was an agendized item at a meeting, correct? That is correct. Okay, got it. Thank yep. you. All right. Um, so within board bylaw 9000, again, if you are adhering to your agreed upon policies, uh, the intent behind those policies to provide transparency and ensure productive working relationships amongst all stakeholders. So the board, hopefully should have a unity of purpose, should have civil and honest communications, and decisions should be based on valid and reliable information. This is in one of your board bylaws, 9,000. Um, we talked about confidentiality in the context of closed session, and your board bylaw reiterates that, confidentiality when required or appropriate. Compliance with the Brown Act and district policies and bylaws, including observing proper roles and giving full attention to proceedings. Respecting and supporting the majority of the board and listening to and considering other points of view. There's some specific areas uh, of governance uh, where the board, individual board members have a certain role. A board president, for example, works with the superintendent to develop the agenda. Um, board members as a whole are expected to prepare for and attend meetings uh, unless prohibited by doing so for, you know, various emergency sickness reasons or other things like that. Boards are expected to use the closed session process properly. Um, a board should be fully informed with questions posed in advance. So to the extent that you get uh, the agenda ahead of time and you have a question about a topic um, that might be complicated or, 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 or an item on the agenda that might be complicated, the best practice is to reach out to the superintendent and ask your question, get the information, 
uh, so that you have it ahead of time, you know what the information means. But if you want to re-ask the question or bring that information up as part of consideration of the item, there's nothing preventing you from doing that. So the intent behind this isn't to ask your questions before the meeting and then stay silent during the meeting, but the intent is to just make sure you understand exactly what it is you're being asked to consider when you're being asked to consider it. Uh, you want to have effective and efficient board meetings with appropriate public comments. Uh, you want to establish goals for the district and evaluation of the superintendent. Uh, we talked about the superintendent, but a lot of boards often meet in the summertime to e establish board goals for the upcoming school year. Uh, I don't know if that's a practice at this district. I, she's nodding her head, so I think it might be. <laughs> we do it in the spring. Okay, in the spring. Um, there should be unity and communication to stakeholders. Just something to keep in mind, the board president serves as the spokesperson for the board. So if there's a crisis, for example, um, and a statement is going to go out, it's usually going to go out under the signature and under the voice of the board president. Um, you know, one of the tragedies I can remember is there was a, a shooting in San Bernardino City Unified School District, and uh, the superintendent at the time, Dr. Marsden, uh, gave a statement, but also the board president at the time was present and gave a public statement to the news media when that situation was going on. And that's, that's kind of, when you elect a board president, you as the other four board members are kind of delegating that responsibility for that person to be the face of the board in the event of a crisis, an emergency, or for any other reason, a celebration in some cases. Um, so that's kind of a best practice in maintaining unity of communication, is making sure that any official communications are coming from the board president. And then board self-evaluation. Self um, it's oftentimes something that's done during the goals creation process. Um, so uh, that would be something you'd look at in the spring. All right, go ahead to the next slide. We're just gonna kind of briefly touch upon some of these things. These are some more governance standards that are included in uh, several of your board bylaws. Um, I referenced them on the previous slide, but I'll, I'll hit at it, or one of the previous slides, I'll hit it again. Uh, 9320, 9322, and 9400. You know, it's important, these seem sort of obvious, but it's always something to remember. These are what your board bylaws say, so it's important to follow it. Keep learning and achievement for all students as the primary focus. Um, value and support and advocate for public education. Again, keep confidential matters confidential. Uh, understand the distinction between board and staff roles and refrain from performing management functions that are the responsibility of superintendent and staff. Um, so that goes back to the conversation we had about directing staff members to do something. Um, as an individual board member, you don't have that authority. However, it's kind of hard for an employee to be approached by a board member and feel confident that they could say no to a board member because they, they may not know the, that that limitation exists, that an individual board member doesn't have any authority uh, to direct um, so just be mindful that, that even though that is true, you are elected officials, you are board members, and so there's a perception of, of authority there even when you're acting in your individual capacity. And then that, just to reiterate that the, under, the, the authority of the board rests with the board as a whole and not with any one individual board member. I'm not gonna belabor this next slide too much because we talked about it about the, the board president being the um, spokesperson for the board, but at that first bullet point, you are allowed to express your personal views uh, when you're meeting with community leaders and participate in uh, public discourse, but to the extent that you are not the board president, uh, I don't recommend that you say something to the effect of, I'm speaking on behalf of the school district. Um, it's okay to share your viewpoints with people um, and, and it's okay to say that I'm a school board member in Temecula Valley Unified School District, but you are not speaking on behalf of the school board unless a majority of the board has designated you to do so. And so the whole next part of this to, goes to ensure it, the board president and the superintendent work with communications, 
Uh, you have board policy 1100 and, uh, and 1112 that, you know, you coordinate all of your communications through the superintendent and appropriate staff. I don't know if you have a public information officer in this district, but if you do, the superintendent will coordinate with that person uh, on communications that go out on behalf of the board. Um, all right, next slide. Public statements and communications. So we talked about um, kind of a limitation in responding to public comment, but board bylaws 9010 and, and 9012 uh, set some parameters for social media communications, um, that your social media communications are held to the same standard as any other communication. So um, if you're making a Facebook post or a Twitter post or something like that, uh, unless you're the board president, I, I would strongly recommend you stay away from saying something, I'm speaking on behalf of the school board uh, or the district. Um, we talked about this a little bit at the last meeting, um, but the idea of serial meetings happening in social media has always been something that caused me concern. The legislature finally recognized my concern and passed a law that prohibits board members from kind of engaging with each other on matters of school district business on each other's social media pages, and that includes clicking the like button or the thumbs up button or the smiley face button or whatever button might exist. So the best practice with social media is to have your own page, stay on your own page, and communicate with your constituents through your own page. Um, if you're going to observe another board member's page, uh, I don't recommend that you engage uh, on that page. Just observe it passively. Don't actively uh, engage with the page. Um, because again, we're going to avoid serial meetings uh, and the concerns that can arise with those. Uh, board member communications are likely subject to disclosure under the Public Records Act. And this includes communication on personal devices um, so any topic that is within the subject matter jurisdiction of the school district and the school board um, that is being discussed on personal devices uh, may be disclosable in response to a public records request. And where this comes from is a California Supreme Court decision from a few years back out of the city of San Jose uh, where city council officials were engaging in city-related discussions with community members and vendors and things like that um, on their personal devices and through their personal email. And a request came in saying, we would like all communications, including communications made via personal email. Uh, and the city said, well, we don't maintain the personal emails of the board, and or of the city council rather, and so therefore we don't have to turn it over and the end result was it got all the way up to the California Supreme Court, and the California Supreme Court said that's incorrect. Um, and there's a pretty lengthy process to go through to satisfy the requirements related uh, to that Supreme Court decision if, if the district were to get a public records request. So just be mindful of your communications, and if they are related to the school district, um, you, you may think twice before sending that email or that text message and recognize that it could be subject to disclosure under the Public Records Act. Now, it's not necessarily going to be disclosable, and, and it's also important to keep in mind that let's say you get a public records request for text messages. It doesn't authorize an individual to rummage through your phone, okay? There's an obligation that you'll have to search for potentially responsive documents, um, but it doesn't provide the opportunity for a member of the public to take custody of your phone and then just start scrolling and looking at your bank and all that sort of stuff. It's real limited only to uh, disclosing any communications that are related to school district business. And the onus is put on the, the elected official to perform the search. Uh, best practice, confidential information should never be transmitted via social media or non-district servers. So to the extent that you are receiving information uh, about, uh, let's say there was, you know, an unfortunate situation where there was a large fight at a school um, and the police had to come and 
and it was a little wild. And, and so Dr. McClay is sending communications to you via district email uh, about the situation. Uh, and you have a question about potentially one of the students that may have been involved. Um, if you send them via your Gmail account or private message on Facebook or text message, there's a chance that that information could get into the hands of people that shouldn't have it. Your school servers uh, have various security protocols in place that we know about, so you want to make sure that if you're going to ask a question about what happened, that you're using district servers or district technology resources for that purpose. And that's not to shield it from disclosure, because some of that stuff may be disclosable at some point in the future. It's primarily to shield it from inadvertent uh, you know, access by people who shouldn't have access to it at the time. All right, next slide. We talked about this a little bit too, so we're not gonna belabor it, but there are limits within your board bylaw, specifically board bylaw 9200, about uh, on board member authority. So that first one's one we already talked about. You don't exercise any respons administrative responsibility as individual board members. That job is left to the superintendent and the folks that have been hired in the school district to do that. Um, I mentioned this again, so we're not gonna belabor it, but the information requests, if you have a need to get some information about something in the district, send it through the superintendent's office. That's what your board bylaws say. If you receive a complaint from a community member, you don't have individual authority to resolve that complaint. So the best practice in that situation is to send it to Dr. McClay, who will then shepherd it to the appropriate department for handling. Um, and when you're having communications with, with your constituents, they're gonna bring a complaint to you about something. Um, let's say it's a Williams complaint. It's a situation where textbooks may not be available or something like that. Um, I don't recommend that you say to that person, oh, I'll handle this and it will be solved. You can say, thank you for sharing this with me. I'm gonna give it to the superintendent and we'll make sure that she follows up with you or something to that effect. But you know, you don't have the authority to resolve the complaint in your individual capacity. There are specific investigatory requirements when you get a Williams complaint, for example. So you wanna stay away from making any promises about anything. Um, and that kind of goes to the last bullet point on this slide. So go ahead and go to the Next slide, please. This is again just public comment, but in the context of your board bylaw 9323, members of the public shall be provided the opportunity to make public comment. Uh, they shall also have the opportunity to address you uh, on items which are not on the agenda at a regular meeting. Um, we talked about reasonable time restrictions. Those are included in your board bylaw as well as you know within the Brown Act as well where we can limit time. Um, we talked about special meetings being limited to what's on the agenda uh, and the, the really important thing to remember is the board shall not take any action or have any discussion on any item that's not on the agenda. So if it's not on the agenda and you start to go on a little discussion about something, Dr. McClay may step in and, and redirect you. Um, I sit as board counsel sometimes for, for school boards and sit up on the dais with the board uh, and I will gently direct them back to the agenda if, if they go off on a little bird walk. It's just my job as your legal counsel to make sure that you stay within the, the parameters of, of your board meeting. Next slide. We talked about this too, um, but it's reiterated in your board bylaws and also in government code section 54952.6 and ed code section 35164. The board shall act by a majority vote of all of the membership constituting the board unless otherwise required by law. That's the language in the education code and that reinforces what I talked about, that if you open a meeting and there's only three member present, all, all three members must vote for something in order for it to pass. And then just reaffirming what the Brown Act says, action by the board means a collective decision or a collective commitment or promise by a majority of the board to take a positive or negative uh, approach to a decision, a vote by a majority of the board, 
when sitting as the board upon a motion, proposal, resolution, order, or ordinance. Actions taken by the board shall be recorded in the board minutes, including individual votes. And so you have a person sitting over there doing a great job taking and recording your votes, and they appear in the minutes that you will be considering at upcoming board meetings, um, and all of the votes will be reflected in those minutes. Next slide. Board bylaw 9270 uh, requires us to comply with conflict of interest laws. There's several conflict of interest laws, and that's a whole other presentation unto itself, but there are two real sources of it. Government code section 1090, that's the big one. The board can't have, uh, no board member can have a financial interest in any decision uh, that the board makes. So if a board member owns a business, for example, um, and a contract to use the services of that business are brought before the board. The board member who owns the business could not just recuse themselves and allow the rest of the board to take action on it. The whole board would be disqualified because that other individual board member who owns the business uh, would have a financial interest in that decision. So we don't see very many 1090 conflict situations come up, um, but just be mindful of that. Uh, the, the other source is the Elections Code. Uh, this is the Fair Political Practices Act. Uh, and this is what requires you to file a Form 700 every year and disclose your financial interests uh, to ensure that you don't have a conflict of interest in a decision that you're making. Um, so, you know, you can get help from the superintendent uh, for filling out your Form 700s. Uh, and if there's a complex issue, the superintendent can contact legal counsel and, and get an answer for you. Um, it's important to avoid the uh, appearance of impropriety when uh, on any decisions you make. Um, so, you know, avoid the, the, the whole idea is the avoidance of this notion that backroom deals are being made and that somebody saw people meeting in the back room and then the board came out and voted on something. Um, there are exceptions to the financial interest rule. Um, if any of you have spouses who are teachers in the district and they've been employed, or classified employees in the district, and they've been employed in the district for more than two years, uh, there's not an issue there uh, with them retaining their employment. This, is, this primarily goes to the new board members uh, on the retention of employment issue. But with respect to uh, experienced board members and new board members, um, you would be allowed to vote on a collective bargaining agreement uh, if you had a spouse employed by the district and it would not be subject to that financial interest concern. The courts have looked at the collective bargaining agreement issue as an issue that applies equally across the, the, the employees in the school district that are, that are subject to that collective bargaining agreement. It's not just unique to that one board member. So the courts have found that there's no conflict of interest there. All right, next question, or next slide. Uh, when you're communicating with the public, and the public will reach out to you, and like I said, you're allowed to communicate with them. Um, they're your constituents and your stakeholders, but like we talked about with respect to complaints and things of that nature, make sure you're funneling those to the superintendent and not trying to resolve those on your own. Um, and that just reinforces the board bylaws that you have in place. With respect to, go ahead to the next slide, with respect to social media, uh, and I'm gonna pull up some notes here just to kind of go into a little bit of what we talked about at the last meeting. Um, you know, social media can be a blessing and a curse. Um, there's a recent court decision uh, from March of 2022 that, uh, addresses the idea of blocking somebody on your social media page. We talked about this really quickly at the last board meeting and the, the idea of having something that holds you out as a government official. Um, and, and if you have that type of social media presence, uh, you are not allowed to block somebody uh, who is, uh, you know, engaging in, in disagreeable con <laughs> conduct on your, on your social media page. Um, you can have reasonable rules. So for example, 
you could have content neutral rules that would say something to the effect of, and, and I'm just riffing here, so don't take this as legal advice, but something to the effect of, you know, any posts that are cut and paste and repeated on three other posts, uh, you know, two of the posts shall be blocked or deleted, for example, and only one of those posts shall remain. Um, the court kind of looked at that in this case uh, as a possibility. But the rules have to be content neutral. They have to be related to a government interest, so keeping order in the discussion might be a government interest involved in that. Um, and they have to be narrowly tailored. So if you were to say, if you post a cut and paste on into three different discussion areas, the same comment, and you were to say those three comments will be deleted and you will be banned for five days, that's likely not narrowly tailored in a way that would pass First Amendment muster. So just be mindful of the First Amendment uh, in, in communications because you are uh, elected officials now. Uh, and so blocking people, uh, it's kind of an emerging area in First Amendment law. Uh, but there are several decisions. There's uh, the Second Circuit, the Ninth Circuit, uh, the Fourth Circuit, and the Eighth Circuit all have decisions on this particular topic, and they're all aligned, so I don't think this issue is going to go to the Supreme Court anytime soon. So the, the reality is, as elected officials, uh, we can't block people on our social media pages um, for disagreeable conduct on our websites. <coughs> Uh, we have new rules. Uh, we talked about this. This is the, you can't, you know, thumbs up, thumbs down, smiley face. This is government code section 54952.2. It's okay to use uh, social media to answer questions, uh, but you cannot, as a majority, discuss items uh, on a social media page amongst yourselves, um, including likes and emojis. And a member shall not respond directly to any communication made, posted, or shared by any other board member. So that doesn't, that's not limited to just typing a comment. That's again, including these kind of passive reactions as well through um, emojis and those things. So, all right, the, the last slide before we get to uh, questions is what can I say to our partners in labor? Um, and, these are your constituents and stakeholders as well, and you can have conversations with them. There are some parameters that are established by the Public Employment Relations Board that prohibit uh, bypassing the exclusive representative in matters that are within the scope of representation. So it's not appropriate to send an email out to the employees and say, you know, we would like to give you X, Y, and Z. Uh, please petition your leadership uh, and have them agree to it. That's unlawful. Um, but it's okay to hear them and, and to listen to the, your, your constituents about things that they're concerned about uh, on their campuses, things that they're excited about on their campuses, uh, in their departments, in their various jobs. Um, but anything related to negotiations is something that should be off topic or, or, or something that you don't discuss. Similar to you know, a family member that, or a community member that you know whose child is being expelled. You can talk about all things, you just can't talk about the expulsion, okay? And so, um, and part of that is to obviously maintain the district's position in negotiations and to not uh, act in a way that might compromise the public's money. Uh, and then, you know, the other part of that is just respecting the negotiations process as it's been established through the government code and through the Public Employment Relations Board. All right, we got to the question and answer part. Do you have any remaining questions that you would like answered? Hearing none, thank you. Thank you, Todd. I think there's no further questions. Any from the board? Okay, I'm going to call a five-minute recess. Um, we can come back. 540. Ten minutes. 545.
we'll be starting with number two, department overviews, and I'll hand it over to Dr. McClay. Thank you. We're excited this evening to uh, provide the board an overview of TVOSD and all of the various departments. We typically do this when we have new board members, and this is kind of the 30,000 foot view. Um, and so we've asked each department lead to give a brief description of their department and what they work on, uh, what the department looks like, what their daily tasks are, et cetera, et cetera. So we'll start with me, and I will probably be the quickest. There we go, because I'm more excited uh, to get to show off what their departments are doing. Uh, you heard a little bit about what I do uh, from Mr. Robbins. So um, we'll go in this order. Uh, I'll turn it over to Mrs. Velez, and then we will go to Human Resources, Business Support, and um, Mrs. Deus will wrap us up with Student Support Services. So from the superintendent's office perspective, as you heard from Mr. Robbins, the board sets the mission, vision, values, and goals, uh, as well as priorities, and then it's our job to bring them to fruition. Our mission in TVUSD is high quality teaching and learning for all. You will see that in many, many places, um, and hopefully we have brought that to life with our work. Um, I will say that I think it's probably time to revisit that, especially when we have a new board. That's a really good opportunity. Um, one of my goals will be to learn as much as I can about your individual um, desires and aspirations for our district and then try to help us as a team turn those into a collective vision and mission um, that will guide our daily work. So the current one is high quality teaching and learning for all, um, but we will begin that process when we have a workshop in February of looking at your priorities as a new group and then whether or not we want to take that as far as the mission or if we just want to focus on the priorities and the goals. Our collective why, which we did with many, many stakeholders just a few years ago, came out to be inspiring excellence and impacting the future. Um, that, again, is something you will see and hear a lot of. And then, of course, we have what we refer to as the schoolhouse document, which I know you've seen before. And that lists not only our six priority areas, but there's a dozen or so benchmarks for each of those priorities that allow us to assess each year how are we doing toward those goals. So when we have our next workshop in February, we will begin that process as a collective group of how much of that do we want to tackle um, in, in redoing for the 23-24 school year. So, and then just last school year, we went through a process of rebranding um, and we came up with, um, we elevate in TVUSD, and we define that as we elevate opportunities, experiences, and each other. And that, I believe, you will see in action when we start our site visits next week. I'm so excited. We are getting and already have gotten most of you scheduled for those, so you'll be out on the campuses. Picture's worth a thousand words, um, and you'll get to see in action these opportunities, experiences, and how we elevate each other as adults as well as students. And then just real quickly, some of our district stats. Um, we cover 213 square miles. Uh, we're, we're pretty large, way out there to the tip of French Valley and then way down south, all the way down uh, Great Oak is our farthest school south. So 213 miles, 32 school sites, that's a lot of facilities. You're going to hear from Mrs. Lash what that involves. Annual operating budget, you got quite a taste of at your first meeting uh, with the first interim report. $423 million on an annual basis. Our enrollment comes in just under 27,000 uh, students. We have exceptional student achievement and too many awards to even list or count. I'm going to share just a few of them on the next page. And then our employees uh, come in just under 3,000 um, with about 1,300 certificated and 1,500 classified. Um, and they make up our two association groups, TVEA as well as CSEA. I mentioned all of the awards. Uh, we remain number one in so many categories. We are excited in January. Um, also, at the end of this month, January 31st, I believe our next regularly scheduled meeting, we'll do an overboard overview, excuse me, overboard, an overview of the uh, latest California dashboard um, standardized testing results. So we're excited to bring that to you on January 31st. Always room for improvement. We're not saying we've arrived and that everything is perfect, um, but we'll use that data to set all kinds of goals for different grade levels as well as different content areas. Um, but this gives you just a little taste um, 
We're exceptionally proud of our U.S. News and World Reports rankings for each of our high schools. It's very, very rare for a district to have all of their comprehensive high schools appear on that list. Um, in addition to all of those, we've got eight gold ribbon schools, 25 distinguished schools uh, for California Distinguished School Honor, and that is a, a huge honor two national blue ribbon schools. We got our first one two years ago and then another one last year. That again is an exceptional accomplishment. 12 green ribbon schools and so much more. I know you got a taste of some of the student recognitions at your first meeting a month or so ago. We have more coming. In fact, we have so many student recognitions. It's hard for us to plan accordingly so that we can get them in and out within that 30 minute period and, and get them a brief recognition from you. But we're very, very proud and we're excited to be able to share that with you. In terms of the team that supports me on a daily basis, I have the honor of, of serving all of the folks on this page. Of course, the Board of Education, I serve as your liaison with the district. Uh, again, bringing your vision and mission to fruition uh, on a daily basis in our schools. Also, the assistant soups. This team over here, holy cow, I, I can't. I'm going to cry when I look at you guys. We, we have been through a lot in the last few years. Um, this team is amazing. Um, I'd go anywhere with the four of you. You're just, they are amazing. I think you're going to see that when you get a, a, a brief taste of their departments. Uh, some of us have been together, I think, 25 years or so, and, and we're, I'm starting to look at they're not, but anyway. Um, and then the two other smaller departments that are relatively new in this district that come under um, my, my team is the communication department. I say department, but it's a department of two. A power to Mr. Evans and Mrs. Mueller. Um, and then, of course, our safety and security department we also put underneath the superintendent's office. Again, a department of, of two, but lots of other people throughout the sites helping out Mr. Vickery and Mrs. Bowers. So with that said, I'm going to turn it over to Educational Support Services. Again, I wanted to go quickly so that they can deliver the meat of it. Mrs. Velez? Great. Well, oh. May I say one more thing? I apologize. If you go back one slide in my haste to turn it over to you, um, one of the things we've recently developed and we gave you all a draft last week is a kind of a new uh, version of our organizational chart district-wide. It's very, very drafty. Uh, you don't see photos yet, but they're coming. But it really is a, a really nice tool. I think it gives a face to the name. It tells you a little bit about each person and where they fit in the organization and so as new board members we thought that would be helpful and it, we need it anyway so um, you don't see that on your slides tonight but i know you all have a draft and i would expect i don't want to put mr evans on the spot but probably within the next week or two we'll have a, a closer to final version that will be released to the public at large thank you okay well good afternoon i think we only have about four minutes left till we run into this evening so i can officially say that so i just want to say what a great opportunity it, opportunity it is to come and talk about educational support services you will many times hear this referred to as ess and i know i can speak for um, dr mcclay and my other assistant soups as well as the many directors from educational support services that are back over here that we're incredibly proud of the work that we do in our district um, serving over twenty seven thousand students um, as well as a lot of principal you're going to hear a lot from me today about our support for our principals and the leadership development that happens in our department but I think I would be remiss if I didn't share that um, I'm myself of a, of a I myself am a byproduct of the great work of this department. I've been in this district over 20 years as a teacher, as a principal, and as a director. But most importantly, and my most important role, um, is a mom of a Chaparral High School graduate in, graduate in 2015. So I, I really wanted to highlight that because our district is all about leadership. It's all about um, finding superstars to really step into our um, assistant principal roles and our principal roles. So. There are two slides that we will talk about with educational support services. It's me giving you a, a, a lot of information on two slides. But really, our goal in educational support services, um, we're responsible for providing leadership and support for district staff, district staff to ensure that each student meets or exceeds district standards by coordinating the development, the alignment, and the implementation of the state curriculum. And as you can see on this slide, educational support services covers four different areas. Curriculum and instruction, many times you will hear it referred to as CIA. Oh, there you go. Um, we have curriculum instruction and assessment. We have our career technical education, accountability and assessment, 
and our early childhood ELOP and bases, and I'll give you a little more information about that. But let me start first with curriculum and instruction and assessment. This department, um, this sub-department, really provides leadership and expertise for programs and services that are supporting the success of all students, educators, and our learning communities in Temecula Unified. We work to promote learning opportunities for all students in a manner that reflects the most recent research focusing, on, focusing in on the science of teaching and learning. And that's really important in this district is we work a lot with our teachers and our assistant principals and principals on the science of teaching because we follow what research says. And the, I'll talk a little bit more about professional development, but you'll hear that in there as well. Our staff provides leadership in supporting the work of our principals by offering staff development opportunities and direct assistance with district and school identified needs. For our career technical education, and many times you'll hear this referred to as CTE, it's a multi-year sequence of courses that integrates core academic knowledge with technical and occupational knowledge to provide students a pathway to post-secondary education and careers. CTE programs um, deliver an enriched educational experience that promotes student interest and academic success, while most importantly developing technical and soft skills um, training that's necessary to meet 21st century workplace demands. Our graduates of today, especially in our district, um, they have rigorous and relevant CTE programs under Mr. Digman and are um, better prepared for high wage, high skill and high demand jobs. Next is our assessment and accountability department. And I think at our last meeting, um, you all got to meet Ms. Lisa Brown, who is our new director for assessment and accountability, and she stepped into a very big job. But our amazing assessment and accountability department is responsible for planning and directing all activities, such as assessments, both state and federal reporting, and all accountability measures, such as the dashboards that will be presented on January 31st, as Dr. McClay talked about. This department is responsible for the administration and reporting of all state mandated assessments. The department also is responsible for activities related to the compliance of Williams case, which ensures that all students have equal access to quality instructional materials, safe and clean facilities, and highly qualified teachers. Finally, the team ensures compliance with state mandated accountability measures related to the California School Dashboard and provides data and support for federal compliance reviews, including federal program monitoring and program improvement review. And lastly, our newest department, um, which we kind of inherited um, from um, uh, the business side of the house, is our early childhood education program, which oversees family programs, such as our BASES, which is our after school program, and then the newly granted expanded learning opportunity program, which offers our unduplicated students additional after school opportunities. And it's been wonderful to um, see this kind of morph into the ESS department. It was phenomenal under BSS, but it, worked, it works beautifully. And um, Mrs. Paradise, who runs all of this, also is very involved in our preschool program as well. So I wanted to talk briefly about major areas that we focus on. And you'll see that those top three um, are bolded, and they're bolded for a reason. And the reason is this is our primary focus. So professional development, this is something we are incredibly proud of. The ESS department coordinates professional development for all of our teachers and our principals. We flood our administrators and our staff with intense and very strategic professional development from the day they start in our district. Mr. Dixon, one of our directors, does a welcome to Temecula um, when we have our new teachers start in our district, and they are flooded with professional development starting on that day. And they, that continues throughout your, the, your entire career in Temecula Valley. It doesn't stop after that one, one meeting. It doesn't stop after your first year. It's a consistent flood of professional development. Our professional development is centered on the most current research, as I talked about before, with our focus on the science of teaching. And to this day, I've heard so many new teachers who have started after one or two years come back and say, I've worked in other districts, and I've never seen how much professional development we receive in Temecula, and we take great pride in that. So um, our directors are consistently monitoring what's going on on our sites. They are on our sites every single day. They're consistently monitoring what our staff needs in order to provide them with the highest quality professional development to positive, positively impact our students. Next is our principal support and coaching. 
This model is what grounds us in our department and makes us special and unique. We are the only school district in Riverside County utilizing this type of coaching model, and it's the central focus of our department. So each of our directors serves, a, each of them has anywhere from five to seven sites that they serve, and at that time they go out either two times a month um, for one hour, or in some cases they'll go out one time a month for two hours, and they coach principals on quality, what quality instruction looks like, looking for evidence of student learning and assisting the principal in expanding their skill set in a role as an instructional leader on their campus. And I'd like to say we do really value all of our principals as instructional leaders and we refer to them what we refer to them when we speak about them in that way. We are of the true belief um, that this is a highly successful model that we've been using for some time and a unique approach to principal coaching. It really gives us so strong site relationships with all of our principals. It's an exceptional teaching tool and a mentoring tool. And really, it focuses on the learning for all. In the past year, we've had the honor and opportunity to have six of our directors attend the National Principal Supervisor Academy in order to grow their own capacity to mentor our site administrators. Next is our assistant principal leadership development. As an ESS department, we are committed to hiring superstar administrators, and it starts with either an intervention administrator or an assistant principal. When we hire assistant principals in our district, we invest time knowing that they'll be joining our ranks as its outstanding principals one day. So our assistant principal staff, they attend once a month aspiring principal academies, focusing on leadership development and the science of teaching. And this is also a great opportunity for them to network, to ask questions, and to learn and grow as professionals. We also meet with them one time a month for the essential components of instruction training that focus on, focuses on clinical supervision of classroom teaching. And then lastly, we ensure that they're involved in the principal coaching model that I talked about a little bit earlier. We're, we ensure that they are part of those meetings and that we really have them involved in our K-12 district leadership meetings that happen once a month. But I think the most important thing that we can offer to our assistant principals that as a district leadership, we have an open door policy in order to grow the best um, principals that we eventually can. With our TK-12 curriculum, we over um, educational support services oversees the TVUSD curriculum that's aligned with state standards and program requirements. Our curriculum processes follow ed code and board policies. And by the time we land on what we're using in the classroom, we followed a careful and very collaborative process. And I think Mr. Robbins talked about that a little bit today in terms of adoption of curriculum. Our TVUSD teachers drive our instruction and our guaranteed and viable curriculum provides them with the necessary content and resources to effectively develop the learning environments and experiences for all of our students. Next is our educational technology. Our ed tech department, headed by Mr. Dixon, um, supports and promotes the effective use, and I think I need to emphasize effective use um, of technology to improve teaching, learning, technology, leadership, and administration through professional development, digital resources, and instructional coaches that are hired um, and that work with Mr. Dixon. We are proud to have a very long-standing rela relationship with Apple um, to promote and support many wonderful programs that are happening on our school sites. And I think the focus is on utilizing technology as a tool and using it the right way in the classroom. Next is the local control and accountability plan. Mr. Robbins did talk about that as well. Um, our department is the oversight um, of the local um, control and ability, uh, local control and accountability plan, or the LCAP, as you will hear it. It's a three-year um, district-level plan that's updated annually. The plan describes the school district's key goals for all students, as well as the specific actions the district will take to achieve those goals and the means to measure that progress. It was, this was an extremely rich and a very quick overview of um, educational support services. Um, we have very complex and a very diverse department, but this gives you a small oversight. Are there any questions or anything that on, on, from the Educational Support Services Department that you may want more information on. Yeah, please do. Please reach out if you do. 
I have a question. Yeah. So I know at the end we'll get to different options that we can get involved in with committees and so forth. Would you give us any more information as to how it ties into this department and overview with maybe what we could be a part of? So there is, you will see on, let me grab my binder. And I know this is, this is to come. Do you mean in terms of the ESS department? Is that what your question is? Okay, we do have the, let me find it real quick. I think it's the curriculum. We have secondary curriculum council um, that focuses on curriculum that's definitely tied to the ESS department. Um, we have the CTE advisory. We have, am I missing one? Community advisory. The athletics, athletics and ASB, and that was one point that I didn't necessarily put on the slide here just for the lack of time as we do oversee ASB and athletics as well as uh, visual and performing arts as well. But those would be the main committees, okay? Like um, Dr. Kamrowski said, if you do have any questions, feel, please feel free to reach out. Um, and I know that um, I am also very excited that Dr. McClay is taking you out to see some of the wonderful things that are happening. And I really think that um, you will see the science of teaching going on in many of our classrooms. And now I'm going to actually pass it to Mr. Arce. Thank you, Mrs. Vallis. I appreciate that. Hello, everyone. I'm Francisco Arce. Most folks call me Frank, so feel free to call me Frank. Uh, and I am proud to be the Assistant Superintendent of Human Resources Development. Uh, just to share a little bit about myself, prior to this position, I was actually Director in Human Resources at a different district. This is actually only my third year here. And uh, prior to that, I was in secondary administration, so high school principal for a few years and middle school and high school AP. And this was after having been a teacher for about nine years. And I should also share that Education is a family affair. Uh, my wife is also in education, and we literally taught next door to each other at some point in our career. So we're very passionate about making a difference for um, the life of students. And um, we have four amazing children. Uh, with that, I chose to work in human resources because I think that the role of our department um, is so critical in supporting students. Uh, so I'd like to share a little bit about the kind of things that we do in the Human Resources Division. And I'll start by sharing that our department is comprised of some amazing individuals who do great work for our district. Mr. Joe Mueller is our Executive Director who works mostly with matters pertaining to certificated staff, of which we have, like Dr. McClay mentioned, about 1,300 employees in our school district. Our other director is Ms. Tiffany Martinez, and she deals with matters pertaining mostly to classified staff, of which we have a little over uh, 1,500. Uh, employees. We currently have a position that's vacant, a management position that's vacant, and that is our assistant director compliance officer position. We also have two amazing administrative assistants in our department, and they are Nancy Morales and Gina Rowe, and they support the work of all of our HRD staff and our management team. And we have another 10 employees who work on everything related to things such as recruitment, posting of positions, processing applications, interviews, credentialing, onboarding, securing substitute staff, and medical leaves, all the other personnel related to these, and they're truly an amazing staff, and we greatly appreciate their work. So that's a little bit about the staff that works with us. Uh, as an overview, the work we do in HRD falls under different categories. So I've listed some of those categories here. The human resources and personnel related work involves things such as staffing and meeting the personnel needs of our district. We're also responsible for different elements of state and federal compliance pieces such as required trainings, credentialing, a uniform complaint process. And part of what we do in human resources also involves maintaining high professional standards. And there are times when concerns or allegations about our employees are investigated uh, to provide any redirection as needed, and we try our very best to work professionally and fairly to conduct any needed investigations. Our division also works with our labor associations in matters pertaining to bargaining, problem solving, and other important union-related aspects. There are four things that I really would like to highlight in this uh, short presentation, and they are one, the work that we do with the associations that I just spoke of and the collective bargaining agreements. Two, our processes for complaints and grievances. Three, our systems for evaluations. And four, the way HRD provides instructional support to our staff. So let's start with, oh, 
this one here. Our department works closely with two labor associations. The Temecula Valley Educators Association is for certificated staff, which includes people like teachers, counselors, school psychologists, and other certificated employees who fall under this category. We also bargain with the California School Employees Association, Chapter 538. This is for classified staff, which includes people like instructional aides, custodians, and several other employees in this category. A lot of our work involves negotiating terms of employment. Those are things like wages, salary, and benefits, and also anything that is somehow impacted or affected regarding their terms of employment. This contract is referred to as the collective bargaining agreement. Uh, aside from the contract, we also negotiate MOUs, memorandums of understanding, job descriptions, and just other formal processes uh, to come to agreement on labor management. On complaints and grievances, uh, we also work to process concerns or complaints from both our employees and our community members. We have a variety of board policies that address how these specific complaints are processed, but most start at the lowest level and informal level with a conversation with a supervisor or a school principal, although we have a designated point person to process and log our complaints. Most of the management staff in our division actually is somehow involved in bringing some type of resolution to the issues at hand. Our department also handles responding to any type of grievance from either TVA or CSEA, and a grievance is actually an allegation that there's been a violation of language in the collective bargaining agreement. So we work through that process, and there is a formal process to, to do that and work through that. I also want to talk about performance evaluations. Uh, that's another critical piece that we do in HRD. We train our school and department leaders on the specific forms that they need to, to use for this process and things to look out for when evaluating these components. Our department provides timelines for completing the evaluations as well as support on ways to document any concerns. When we have concerns, for example, regarding performance or conduct, we appropriately guide our school leaders to document those with things like improvement plans or other evaluation tools. Um, things that may lead to employee disciplinary action are normally based on our expectations for professional standards and our process for documenting those are in accordance with the CBA, the Collective Bargaining Agreement, and each respective association. In closing, I want to share that one of the most important roles in HR is to make sure we're supporting vibrant and rigorous instruction for students. We do this by making sure we fill the needs in staffing uh, for classified and certificated positions with the best people we can. We strive to recruit exemplary candidates and equip them with the training needed to serve our students. In doing things like supporting our administrators on how they approach their master's schedules or meeting the needs of special programs and helping teachers advance their education, we know that those types of supports translate to helping kids have an engaging learning experience. And those are some of the things that we are extremely proud of in our division. So we're happy to make that one of our highest priorities. With that, that was a brief overview of our department. Are there any questions for HRD? Otherwise, I'll hand it right over to Ms. Nicole Lash in Business Support Services. Yeah, real quickly. Are you involved in uh, recruiting student teachers and uh, making sure that people who do come here are uh, Yes, we qualified? are. We work closely with lots of colleges and universities in placing student teachers, and that's mutually beneficial for obviously uh, the, the hours that they've got to put in, in in terms of the practicum, but it's also, uh, a uh, good deal for us because those are our future aspiring teachers and many of them come from our community, so yes. All right, thank you. Good evening, I think um, I mentioned when I presented the budget that I am a graduate of this district. I'm in my eighth year as an employee um, and what I didn't mention is I also have two little kiddos on these campuses, a TKer and a second grader um, and it, it's an absolute privilege to represent business support services. Um, I told Dr. McClay this has literally been a dream of mine and a passion of mine, being a CPA and then applying that 
to a school district setting, how do, how do you make that fit? Well, this is the perfect fit, in my opinion. And um, looking at the list of directors here on the screen, I oversee eight different departments um, in business services, and there is not one director that is not either a graduate of this district, has a child uh, uh, on one of our campuses, or m has had multiple children that they've seen graduate from this district. So business support services is really uh, very passionate and all in, it's more than just a job or a career to us we're very invested in these campuses and the, f the work that we do and unfortunately I, I always call business support services the backbone of the district um, we're very behind the scenes and unfortunately you don't really hear or see a lot about any of these departments um, when they're operating well right so uh, when students are getting fed when uh, facilities are clean when payroll is processed on time we're kind of operating in the background and so um, as board members often when you're on campuses and you hear about business support services it'll be the anomaly of the HVAC unit not working or the the bus that was late and so just think about th the flip side of that is all of the incredible work that goes into the operations on a day-to-day -day basis um, from these divisions that you don't hear about so we're kind of the unsung heroes sometimes Fiscal services, we, I know you heard about in the last um, board meeting when you heard about the budget, they are all things money. So cash receipts, they pay our bills, they process all of our payroll, manage our budget, uh, maintain all of our accounting, and then also we chair the ad hoc budget committee, which does a lot of the legwork for compensation discussions with our TVEA association, um, to name a few things that they oversee. Nutrition services, if you have never been onto a high school campus during lunchtime, Chick-fil-A has nothing on us. Um, it is absolutely incredible what this division is capable of. So pre-pandemic, only students that qualified for free or reduced lunches got to eat um, at those reduced prices. Post-pandemic, there's a law passed, every single student eats breakfast and lunch for free every single day. And what this did was it doubled the number of breakfasts that we serve on a daily basis and it increased our meals uh, served on a daily basis by 50% overnight. And our nutrition services department did an incredible job adjusting to that. And last year served just shy of 2 million meals. 2 million meals last year to our students, um, which is just an incredible feat considering the food shortages, there were days when they said you're not getting chicken or you're not getting cheese and, um, and labor shortages. So nutrition services has really um, come a long way in the last two years and, and adjusted nicely. And like I said, they, they almost perform miracles every single day at lunchtime. IMS, very similar story. We became one-to-one -one overnight when the pandemic hit. One of the silver linings, I would say, of the pandemic was becoming one-to-one. -one. We thought it would take us years and years and years to get there, and, and we got there um, in a matter of a month, I wanna say, um, during the pandemic. And what that did to our IT department and the support that they have to provide, not only to students, but to our teachers and our staff who now are, um, also all have devices in their hands that they're providing instruction on. We are on campuses providing direct support through um, IMS, but we're also uh, in the, uh, at the district office providing remote support. And uh, many of you have actually already met our IT department and utilized their services. Um, and so they have, uh, through the pandemic, really um, expanded not only the number of devices that they're supporting, um, but the type of devices that they're supporting as well. Our risk management department um, oversees our workers' compensation program, and we are self-funded for workers' compensation, which is a, gr um, a great accomplishment. They also oversee employee benefits, civil litigation, um, amongst other things, and our property and liability insurance. Our purchasing and warehouse, so um, we process you know, just shy of 8,000 purchase orders a year. They maintain our warehouse and our inventory. They do all of that receiving. They make sure the sites have what they need when they need it. And um, many people don't know this, but there's very specific contract law in regards to being a school district. And so our purchasing department makes sure that those procurement laws are being followed in every single thing that we're purchasing. Our M&O department is probably our largest classified division in the district, um, and they make sure that all of our facilities are maintained 
in good repair, the lights turn on, the HVAC unit works, um, that our facilities are cleaned. And this becomes more and more challenging as our facilities are aging, right? Um, those HVAC units, the roofs start leaking and, and all of those things. So over time, it becomes harder and harder to maintain facilities, but we, um, we do an incredible job and um, we really pride ourselves on getting to work orders in a timely manner, following up and following through. Student transportation, we have a huge transportation division. We actually provide home to school transportation when we're not legally required to, but the majority of transportation that we provide is for our special education students. Um, we have a fleet of, um, so we have 65 drivers. We have 17 aides that ride on those buses. And with the late, the implementation of late start, I think we added about 12 routes overnight this year with that implementation of late start and we just continue to add services and add services. Again, we experienced great um, labor shortages in our transportation division this year and um, that really was something that we had a hard time overcoming. We worked very closely with HR to try to provide that training in-house and convert folks from, we, we overnight worked with CSEA and came up with a uh, van driver um, job description and so we could transport students in vans while we trained staff to get their bus driver certification to then drive buses and so we've been really working hard to try to address that labor shortage but this is a statewide a statewide issue luckily it's um, not as bad as it's been but uh, this year has been a challenge with student transportation um, but we are on the mend Facilities development, so this encompasses construction, modernization, and reconstruction of schools. Um, I know we've got quite a few uh, large construction projects going on right now, but in total we have 51 facility projects going on right now, district-wide, which is exciting. And then also part of our facilities development department is our energy managers. They help us with cost avoidance by being um, uh, very conscious of being energy wise and so they help remind us to unplug things when we go on vacation and things like that and we have had 13 million dollars in cost avoidance thus far since bringing them on board with that I'm happy to answer any questions regarding business support services okay mrs. Davis just a comment and I make it all the time I don't know how you do it Nicole So uh, I'm Nicole Dayas, the other Nicole. Thank you, Nicole Lash. Um, and I'm here to talk to you this evening about student support services. And uh, we are a large, far-reaching department. Um, so I'm excited to introduce myself to you this evening. Um, I have been in our district for 16 of my 25 years in education. I've been able to serve as an English teacher, um, an assistant principal, a principal uh, chap at Chaparral High School. Um, and have been able to ha spend some time in ed services and, and now I have the fortunate opportunity of fulfilling this role in supporting our student populations uh, who need us in order to access the curriculum um, and success academically that's awaiting them in their classrooms. I have um, an incredibly talented and professional team of professionals who work to empower, challenge, and inspire our TVUSD students every day. Um, and I'm also the parent of four very different learners who all fall in the different scope of uh, learning types that you might see in the classroom, um, two of which who've graduated and two of which who are still TVUSD students as a middle schooler and a high school. So Student Support Services works every day to support every student, all students, so that they can access their academic environment. We support and equip students for success. So in order for some of our students to be able to engage effectively with the math and English and social studies and science and uh, VAPA and everything that's going on in their classrooms, we're there to make sure that we are looking at the whole student so that they have that access. I'm fortunate to have uh, three subdivisions in our department. One is special, edu special education, excuse me, with Breck Hilton, our director, 
uh, Leticia De Morel, our assistant director. Uh, we have Amy Ramos and Gwen Riley, who are both our coordinators, one for behavioral health and one for autism. And we have six highly talented program specialists who are credentialed administrators and have special education backgrounds who work directly to support our sites with students and IEPs and specific cases and community outreach and work with parents. Our Student Welfare and Success Department, we have Jess Caponegro, who is our director, Donna Leon, who's also our director. You may hear her name as well this semester. She's also serving here at Temecula Valley High School as interim principal. Um, she's holding down the fort over here. We already miss her, it's only been two days. Uh, Kelly Gradstein is our assistant director and Amanda, Amanda Chapman is our lead nurse. Um, in our equity access and inclusion department, uh, Dr. Price is our coordinator. Um, and I'll go over each of these departments a little bit. Recognizing, as Dr. McClay said, this really is that 30,000 vantage point. It's really impossible to get much further than where we are in these next couple slides. But my hope is, is that it provides you with enough information in terms of background. We love acronyms in education and special education just revels in them. So we have some acronyms that are gonna be important for you to know as you're out visiting sites. TVUSD is a single district SELPA. SELPA is a, se a special education local plan area. Um, back in 2013, TVUSD uh, was approved to become its own SELPA. This is a huge feat. There are many SELPAs that ex exist in the state of California. M most of them are multi-district SELPAs, so multi-district special education local plan areas. When TVUSD became its own SELPA, it was because of the reputation, the work, and the numbers um, in TVUSD. So we have 4,200 students served on an IEP this year. Um, and we have quite a few numbers out for um, initial IEP, so that number continues to fluctuate as we go throughout our year. We have 202 teachers um, at our sites, and really impressive number, 670 aides supporting our students out at sites in classrooms, either working with groups of students um, or one-on-one. -on -one. Our district team includes our um, directors and coordinators, as I've noted, program specialists, uh, support office staff, behavioral health, autism, and you can see the list that goes down um, to our physical therapist, our adaptive PE, et cetera. Some of these individuals have house, uh, housed themselves, it is houses because they practically live um, with the district, but at the district office, and some of these individuals are actually uh, located in offices on our sites. Regardless, um, if you, for example, our school psychologist, you will see them connected to a site, our speech language pathologist, um, but we have many individuals who serve multiple students across school sites. So they either share school sites or they have a caseload that falls you know, over the regions in the district. Our various programs that you're going to hear about, and I encourage you when you are out visiting sites to ask to see our precious students and our amazing teachers and staff in these highly successful classrooms. Um, if you understand that we have a preschool, um, special education preschool uh, to, in two locations, one at Jackson Elementary and one at Alamos Elementary. Um, but for our K through 12 programs up to 22, so we have an adult transition program Classrooms exist on Chaparral High School's campus and Temecula Valley High School's campus. In between that, there's two categories, um, definitely based on student need, um, also based on the credentialing of our staff. So our mild to moderate uh, programs fall under RSP and SDC. We have some mild and moderate specialized programs. Our Bloon program, which we have expanded over the course of the years and we're very, very proud of, um, and our SEAL program. Our moderate to severe specialized programs include Bridge, our CLS, structured uh, teaching environments pr uh, promoting student success, STEPS, told you we love acronyms, um, LEAPS and ATP. So I tell you this because when you're out on a campus, some of our elementary sites and our secondary sites have programs that another site may not, just based on student numbers and student need. So you can go back to this as kind of your cheat sheet, um, which to be honest, I've still had to do, uh, to go back and see what program we're talking about. Again, highly recommending that you go throughout. Special education is uh, so involved with our parent community and our outreach. We work to partner with our families, um, either at the school site all the way to the district office. Uh, we 
represent the work that's being done in the classrooms and just want our parents to understand that 100% we share a mutual interest in the best outcome and success for each student. Our student welfare and success team um, has our directors and our assistant director. This is where we are able to support and work with our social workers, our student assistant program facilitators, our lead nurse, and with her, our school nurses um, and our LVNs, our health clerks, database and software specialists in our department, our registration technicians. Uh, you may hear the term CEC. That's our centralized enrollment center. Uh, so when students are returning to a school site, they are able to go directly to uh, their school site and make sure they get their, um, their packet ready and they update everything, their annual notification on Infinite Campus. But when they're new to the district, they go through our centralized enrollment center where we're able to welcome them, make sure we have everything that we need, and process the paperwork so that they are successfully inducted into the district and then we communicate with the respective sites so that they can have that warm handoff to the site and be able to get that schedule so that they can participate at their school. Um, and then our support office staff, which is incredible. I included on this slide um, just how our student support services team in line with this theme of Elevate is also looking at specific goals and criteria for how we can continue to build what we do. Student Welfare and Success is not an acronym, SWS, that every district holds. Many districts, as you learn, will refer to it as CWA, Child Welfare and Success. And for many years, TVUSD did have a CWA with a high functioning department. But through the work um, specifically of Dr. McClay and Kimberly Velez over the last few years uh, before I joined this team, the decision was made for it to become SWS where we focus less on just that welfare and attendance component, which directly related at times to that discipline, um, and more about all the supports that we can provide students, as I mentioned before, so that they can access what they need to successfully and experience that same fulfilling feeling of being connected with their site and experiencing success. So our services and supports that fall under that are, as I mentioned, our CEC, our health services, our SEL team, which are out supporting our sites. We have a very strong parent and community outreach program. We run Family University. Um, we focus on and are the liaison with the county for our McKinney-Vento and our foster youth. We do 504 trainings, compliance, and supports for our site. We look at student intervention behavior and response. And I want to say that behavior sometimes takes a negative connotation when we talk about it. Behavior can also be very positive. We're looking for positive indicators of successful behaviors in our classrooms. So our students are showing that while they're at that desk, they're learning. So we look at that positive response as well as a response when interventions are needed when it's not so positive. And that leads sometimes to our suspensions and expulsions, which our team supports our sites through. Um, you've already had an opportunity to meet some of the team at our first board meeting. We do student attendance. Um, this includes our SART and SAR process, drug awareness, alcohol substance abuse prevention, and our restorative practices initiative. Equity, access, and inclusion, it's important to note in this team line here um, that we do have our coordinator, um, Dr. Price, who's fantastic. We have an equity, access, and inclusion leadership team, and they also support our EAI site representative. So every one of our school sites has an EAI representative. But with equity, access, and inclusion, it's not something in our district that we can say it's a right there answer. You can't really just point to it. EAI is thread through everything that we do. So a part of our team, it's really important to note, is our site leadership and our district leadership. Because when we break down what each of these terms mean, we're looking at access as opportunity to fully participate in campus life, equity as a fair and just outcome for all to achieve their full intellectual and professional potential because we are preparing our students for their futures every day, starting in those preschool classes, and inclusion, an individual or group sense of belonging as a valued member of campus life. So equity, access, and inclusion combined with our special education and our student welfare and success 
can really be summarized in the illustration of these intervention pyramids. And this doesn't even really do it justice. It just gives a visual to demonstrate what a student has access to, what programs there are available, or what staff is currently doing to intervene and support appropriately. When you look at the green area for tier one of our social, emotional, and behavioral tiered supports, any pyramid that has this level of intervention is operating under the assumption that, first of all, 100% of our students have access to the tier one with 100% of our staff understanding what it means to provide this for our students on a daily basis. Sometimes students need a little bit more and we are data driven in our response. And we also make sure that through each travel into these tiered systems that we're communicating with families and teachers as a full school community who are partnering together for the success of the student. Students may move into that tier 2A or tier 2B category. And you'll notice that in tier three, that's really where we focus um, and house many of our special education supports and programs. Noting, however, that a student who's in a tier three, tier two, or tier A can go in a fluid way between all of the tiers and has access to all. So this provides a little bit of putting um, those last three slides into a visual to show where they might fall and how we work every day in student support services to make sure that students have the access that they need and the supports that they need to accomplish their goals. And uh, again, kind of hard to put it in five minutes, but if there are any questions uh, that I can help you with for student support services, I am more than happy to do that. Thank you all. Okay, now we're moving on to item three, governance handbook. Um, this was just my idea. There's no way I'm gonna read all 50 pages from our binder. My thought is to maybe go five pages at a time and go through it. Wanted to see what the board thinks. Like take it in what, categories. What's the plan here? What, the governance is this a handbook. Presentation or is this just no, something we no, just wanted just, to? No, it's for us to review basically five pages at a time. If there's any questions, maybe we can ask Dr. McClay. And that way we can get through the whole handbook because we have to sign it, but I'm not sure what date we have to sign it on. So this would be your opportunity if you want to make changes, if you want to ask clarifying questions. This governance handbook is kind of your own um, operating book. It's your norms, your protocols, how you agree to work together, how we as a team of six, as a team, all, of all of us agree to work together. And so it's just, it's reviewed annually. You can spend as much time on it as you want or as little time on it as you want. So I think Dr. Kamrowski and I talked about, maybe we chunk it, take the first few pages and just, does anyone want to discuss any of it? Have any suggestions for changes? I know a couple of you have mentioned things to me individually that maybe you'd like to suggest revising. So this is that annual opportunity for that. Just perusing it, uh Quickly, it looks like there's a lot of stuff that we've already gone over with the attorney, especially from the beginning. Uh, governance, unity of purpose, mission and board priorities. Almost all those things are things that we've, that this were reviewed overlap. for us. So, uh, I mean, I don't know if anyone has any specific things they wanna talk about, but I mean, it, almost everything is something that we've already heard from the attorney, so. And I would also just suggest if we're going to do that, because I didn't realize that was the plan tonight, so I haven't like yeah. read the first whatever number of pages to review that in thoroughly. So maybe if we decide tonight what our plan is going to be so that we can come prepared to whichever meetings that we're going to discuss that, um, that if there were, you know, if we said we're going to review X part on this night, so bring your thoughts for that so we could do it kind of more quickly just bringing our thoughts. I, 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 would, I would completely agree with that. I want to bring it back on January 31st. And just yeah, review. I think if we all you know, look through it at home, uh, see if anything sticks out that we want to discuss and we come back together and share our ideas and, and that way we don't have to, I mean, Sounds I'm a quick great. reader, but I don't think I want to read all 50 yeah, I, pages I, right I, now. I, I'm in full agreement. I, yeah, I unless there's something want. specific that I think yeah. you would like to, to yeah. address immediately, okay. I, I think just going through it and so could, I, could I make a motion? Yeah. Well, can and I, I was just that uh, we uh, clarify my question. I'm sorry. 
if you don't mind. Go. Cool. Uh, doing our due diligence, when, when uh, can we sign this after the 31st then if we put it to the, yeah, that way if we make the motion to push it, we know okay. we can sign so it. So I, I move that we, is yeah. that, no? Can we just review we it don't need a motion. individually yeah. and then come back and bring our questions? Okay Why don't we that? agendize it on the 31st um, for a discussion and ask you each to review it between now and the 31st. Right. Pay close attention to the norms, the protocols. Like you've pointed out, a lot of it is repetitive from the Brown Act, but this is more the board's collective agreements amongst your team of how you're going to approach things. And so yeah. now that you've had a month or so under your belt, and we've had a few uh, different experiences, it's a good time to read it through the lens of, do you envision yourself working under these norms and protocols, or do you want to discuss maybe making some revisions? So question on that, if we look to make a revision and we discuss that, is that then voted on to go ahead and make that change, or is it just, how, how is that decided exactly? It would need to be a collective, we would need three of five. You can okay. do that officially yeah. or unofficially, but this is a document that you're all hopefully agreeing at the end of that discussion that, that those are the norms and protocols we'll, we'll abide by. Great, thank you. Cool. It, is, there, is there an opportunity as we go through, because we may not catch everything you know, on that, that first view, but this is something that if we do run into a situation where we feel like a policy needs to be changed, we can bring that up at any time. Absolutely, right. yes. So, yeah. okay. And the other thing just to recognize is that a lot of it is not optional. It's, 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 it's tied to ed code. Yeah. Um, and I think, I wasn't here when this was originally written, but I believe that that is, you know, it comes from a template that is used, you know, most boards in California, but m much of it is tied to ed code, so it's not necessarily negotiable. And that, that's why I, I mentioned, if you pay a, if you don't necessarily need to read every word. I mean, it cites cases and it refers to the Brown Act and, and, and not to minimize those, but really hone in on the protocols and the norms by which we would operate as a team that do have some flexibility. And if you'd like, I can put in our weekly communication page numbers or sections that you can review so you don't have to go through the whole thing, it's up to you. But you, you're technically signing that you ab will abide by the whole thing. That so. sounds like a lot of your time. Okay. <laughs> Peruse it at we your leisure and we'll discuss it on the 31st. <laughs> okay. is, is there anything Jeffy? missing in this particular guide that's different from last year's? And does any of that matter? Is it just reformatted? <laughs> So that's a great question, and, and Dr. Kamraski noticed today, um, I believe there's one item where number five and number six were merged, so there's, there's no content missing, but they became one number, and then I believe Mrs. Anna Sebar um, was gracious enough to condense a little bit of some page breaks, but there's no content to our knowledge that is any different than last year. So. Perfect, that was easy. Um, now under four, um, the committee representation. My question for clarification on this is, can we choose two or three, or is it limited to two? How does that work? I'll let you guys go first. So this is something that we do every year, typically at uh, a January meeting, where the board is signing up to engage in any of these committees that you are interested in. Um, I think that Mrs. Weersman uh, asked a question of Ed Services earlier. There are more committees that the district has, far more. These are ones that we've had board representation on in the past, but of course you are always welcome to attend anything. The reason we ask you to sign up is, is for several reasons. First of all, it gets you on the invitation list. So you will then get an invitation every time one of these groups is going to meet. It doesn't mean that you necessarily need to attend every single meeting. Sometimes a board member might just go to one or two during the year. It gives you a really good perspective and lens to understand the process because oftentimes you see things at the very final step. And so if you've been to a committee or two throughout the school year, you kind of go, oh wait, I remember, and this has gone through a much more involved process prior to getting to the board. You serve in an ex officio manner, so you're there really more as a listener, as an observer, you're not a voting member if it's a voting committee. A couple of them are standing committees, so they do follow Robert's Rules or Brown Act, others of them are not, so they're, you know, they're less formal. Um, we ask that there's no more than two who sign up, again, because then we would have a Brown Act situation. So that's really the reason you're signing up. 
Um, and you can go to as many of them as you'd like. There's no limit, Dr. K, in answer to your question. Yeah. Can we sign up for more than two? Is two the max? I didn't hear the last part. Um, is there any maximum that we can sign up for if we wanted to do three? No, is absolutely not. In fact, we've had board members in the past, if they have a little bit more time, they might sign up for, Mr. Schwartz is holding up four fingers. Because yeah, I'm, um, I'm, I'm retired, so I was on four. And then there are other but folks like, who say, oh, I need a nighttime committee. Some of them meet committee. early in the morning. So like at eight in the morning, oh, or like at Athletic Advisory Council. So if you work, you were, you, I mean, you could sign up for athletic advisory, but you'd have to zoom in from your job because they meet at eight in the morning. Same thing with DLAC, that also meets at eight in the morning. I, so I was actually gonna ask that. Is, is, do we have that information just so we make sure? I'm worried about commitments. So, so we, we <laughs> added to this piece of paper, this is the first time we've ever added descriptions. And in those descriptions, I did ask that the team put schedule. Um, this is an in kind of an informal list. So if you if you sign up for one and, and you as a collective group agree that member A and member B are gonna be on this committee and then you find out that it meets at a time when you can't attend, we can swap you out. It's a fluid list. I'll go last. And uh, what I'd say, Ms. Barclay, since you have two up there and, and Mr. Schwartz. I have two yeah. up there too. Oh, you have two up there. We'll um, wait for everyone to go yeah, before we go again. I'll let you you know what you want? Oh yeah, there's cool. there's a couple that are okay. <laughs> <laughs> we just well, and, uh, and I was gonna <laughs> say I'm I'm on PTA, but I didn't receive information about that. I don't know if they were meeting or I'm not sure. Um, so I don't know if that's an active committee or it has been active with Mrs. Specs or Mrs. Anderson. So we'll make okay. sure that we okay. Yeah. Or if somebody else wanted that one instead, I have no. Um, emotional ties to it because I have not been to any meetings yet. <laughs> but ASB meets at 2 in the afternoon, so. Which one? ASB. If anybody wants that, it's uh, middle of the day. So my, my, my two that stood out to me were athletic advisory and CTE. Athletic advisory meets at 8 in the morning. Yeah. Just so fine. you know. I don't really work. <laughs> okay. Mostly okay, so Mr. Gonzalez wants us athletic advisor and CTE. Okay. Any more, or just those two for uh, now? Well, yeah, I mean, it's fluid. I, mean, we I didn't want everybody to. <laughs> well, that's it's such a hard decision. Yeah. Yeah. I, maybe it would I'm, be good I, to do two at a time, and then once two. we go through. Some that I'm interested in. I'm not. If anybody else wants, you know, to. Go ahead. Um, but the Jack? superintendent's council sounds awesome. Um, Master facilities and then the city committee were the other ones that I was interested in. What's your top two? Those are the first two I gave. Okay. Yep. Top two, okay. So for me, hard decision, but I definitely would like to go for district PTA. So I don't know if Mrs. Barclay would we do that together. That could be possible. I love recognizing people and just seeing them awarded for all their hard work. So employee recognition committee, I would love to be a part of that. Um, I also circled secondary curriculum council. So those three, but I could pick more. So what's your top two if we were just narrowing it down? To so six? top two, I would probably say district PTA and then the curriculum. Um, I know the employee recognition doesn't meet as often, so that might be an easy third one to layer, mm -hmm. but those would be my top two. Okay, perfect. And then Ms. Barclay or Mr. Schwartz, you can go. Um, I would like to add the city committee to my, and I'm I'm fine to um, to step off of PTA if you I want to do that. One. It's first. It's activities directors committee, if no. that's what they call it. Yeah, but I would. ASB. If for my third, I would take the first one, athletic activities directors committee ASB. And I'll just stay with the other two I have. And then Danny, did you take the city one as well as your top two? Um, he said athletic and CTE. Yeah, well, well, massive George facilities. Said. Well, if, I mean, was, was that you? That was yours? Yeah. In the city one? Mm -hmm. um, did we already get someone on, on any of the other ones? Well, I was so going to go. I was going to choose city as one of mine, so I didn't know if it was your top two. 
Is no. it going to be my top two? No. Okay. And I was, That's uh, I was asking for clarification. Okay. I, w I was thinking more like master facilities and use some of kind of my skill set mm -hmm. to help the way. Definitely. Okay. So. so then my top two, I take um, the city and then... Community Advisory Committee, Special Education. Um, maybe for a third. I don't know how many people chose this Athletic Advisory Committee. Just three. I'd like that as my third. And then, and then question for clarification, Stas, um, would I be working with you on the Special Education and Community Advisory Committee? Because I remember some of that was in your thought it was. Yes, Gwen Riley, our coordinator of autism, works directly, but the actual panel is made up of teachers and parents. Cool. And so while I'm there and Gwen Riley is there, we'll be participating with the stakeholders. Okay. Please. Okay, <laughs> so if, if we give everyone the first, second, and third choice, here's what I have, and so I, I just need you to make sure I'm correct. On the athletic Activities Directors Committee, we would have Mrs. Farclay and Mr. Schwartz. Athletic Advisory, Mr. Gonzalez and Dr. Kamrowski. Community Advisory Special Education, Dr. Kamrowski. CTE, Mr. Gonzalez. District PTA, Mrs. Wiersma and Mrs. Farclay. Employee Recognition, Mrs. Wiersma. Secondary Curriculum Council, Mrs. Wiersma. Superintendent Student Council, Mr. Schwartz. Superintendent's Council, Mr. Gonzalez and the TVOSD City Committee, Mrs. Barclay and Dr. Kamrowski. If we add a fourth choice, I would have Mr. Gonzalez on Master Facilities as well. Do I have that correct? I don't think so. Sounds good. So why don't, um, how about this? If, if I ask Mrs. Anna Seabar to put all the names in and we'll get it to you this week, take another look at it. I'll also ask staff to add the times and dates that these, these groups meet, and if anyone would like to make a change, again, this isn't something you necessarily vote on, you're just all coming to collective agreement that this looks good as a, as a first round, and then if we wanna make exchanges or trades, we can do so. Okay, and you could take me off PTA, and then I'll move to um, uh, Superintendent and Council. Okay, so I'm taking you off PTA and I put you on Superintendent's Council, correct? Okay. Any yeah. other changes or anybody else want anything else on draft one? Uh, is there any policy if we have our two or three that we can't drop in on something else if there's only the one person so it wouldn't be the violation? You're always welcome. And remember in my weekly communication with you, I always put a, a box of upcoming events. So we do our best to put the committees in. Yeah. We don't always get them all, but we do our best, and you are welcome as long as we keep it to two members. Yeah, once you uh, assign, get it signed, Linnea will put it on your calendar. So you'll get it, uh, you'll get it on your district calendar. You'll get an invite to each meeting of okay. every committee that you're on. And there's also something that is not a committee, but I go to, and, and sometimes the superintendent goes to. It's super, uh, student of the month. It's held at the Sizzler in uh, Murrieta and various uh, students from high schools in Temecula are honored every month. It's early, it's 7.45 and in the so morning. You usually <laughs> rotate that invitation, well, right? It, it, it's, it's uh, Rotary sponsors it and a couple of us, um, the other one. It's an amazing event. It's going on the 32nd year. Uh, Sally Myers does it, shout out to Sally. Um, and they do it and I, I, I want to say a dozen or so cities. What I try to do for that, because it is such an amazing event, it is monthly. I go every month on the rare occasion that I can't, cabinet fights yeah. over who gets to go in my place because it's one of the most amazing, heartwarming stories that validates the work that you do. Take a box of Kleenex. Um, I try to rotate it, and so I will ask each of you as we're in our yeah, meetings go, really every fun. month, are you available, are you available, because again, only, only, only two would be able to attend with me at once. So I try to rotate, by the end of the year, you will have gotten to go to a couple of them. It's not it's only our special. high schools, it's uh, all the high schools in Temecula, so it's Linfield and uh, um, um, Rancho. Rancho and St. Uh, Jean's, Jean's is there now. 
And uh, so every month it's different high schools and they pick one student and the student comes with their parents and their teacher and they talk about why they got picked and it's really amazing. It's so, very uh, special, but yeah. you'll all be invited to those. And if you can't go one month, I'll ask another person and I'll circle back again. My right. goal is to get you all it's there fun. a couple times during the year. Very exciting. Okay, that's it. We have H, uh, announcement of next meeting, the next regular open session business meeting of the Governing Board of Education is scheduled for January 31st, 2023. And this, uh, I adjournment, the meeting adjourn uh, Tuesday, January 10th, 2023 at 6.57. Good night. <laughs>